Hello, everybody. Welcome back to What Magic Is This Podcast, a podcast about magic, the occult, the esoteric, the paranormal, the supernatural, and the weird. Lo and behold, we are back with the one and only Alexander F. of Glitch Bottle Podcast. Now, it's been about a year, and in that period of time, Alex, an introduction to Solomonic magic was Halloween of 2022. That episode is actually my fourth most downloaded episode of all time. So I, I'm super happy to have you back on here because we cut that one short. We, uh, we, I had this whole list of things we were going to talk about, and then eventually it was like, man, we only got through half of it. We have to talk. Uh, we have to talk again at some period of time. And uh, yeah, it's everybody's favorite episode. So I have to ask you, how have, how have you been, Alex? Welcome back. How have you been? And what's your year been like since we last chatted? And tell me all the things, man. Oh. Douglas, it is an honor to be back with you, um, truly, because I, I've just seen your incredible work, you know, your episodes, your content. It's it's so great and so needed, um, and especially in in a world, as the old uh, movie trailer guys used to say, where things seem to be so chaotic and there's so many different moving parts, whether personally or nationally or internationally. And so for me, it's so great to be back because you're right. Since the last time you and I sat down about a year ago, there's been really great things going on with, you know, uh, personal evocatory procedures, working with colleagues, solo procedures that have been really fascinating, especially in uh, more of a natural environment, which has been great. Uh, but also, yeah, working, chatting with different guests and and further research, you know, as as you know, Douglas, better than uh, most people on planet Earth, there's always another grimoire or a translation or a working group, you know, digesting specific syntactical uh, accentuations and Latin declensions, you know, from 1355 or something. So there's always something going on. Uh, it's been it's been a really a really good year magically. And of course, being that we are bound, uh, at least in some capacity in this Malkuthian coil, um, there has been, of course, you know, you're being pulled away. I'm being pulled away from different daily obligations and then family obligations pop up and there's travel involved and everything else where it's like, okay, boil things down to your kind of core rituals, daily rituals, and then plan more of the longer operations. So I'd say that's in the last year, that's been kind of my, my ebb and flow. Amazing. I love it. Yes. Yeah, so the, the episode that we did, a lot of people are saying it's, their favorite episode of what magic is this? And a lot of them, I think it, and I find this shocking because I had people who've come to my podcast that had never heard of Glitch Bottle. I'm like, yo, shut up. Throw my throw my podcast in the trash. You gotta go listen to this episode, this episode, this episode, this episode of Glitch Bottle. So people are loving that that episode that we did about a year ago. Except for one thing, Alex, they say, they said, Doug and Alex throughout the entire episode, all they did was just heap praise on each other to such a nauseating degree and i'm just and guess what but listeners listen here too bad we're gonna big up each other each and every opportunity that we have because uh you know this this magical circle needs to grow it, it, it's a magical circle love i don't even know where i'm going with this but truly i say too bad listeners too bad <laughs> i'm gonna talk about how great glitch bottle is throughout this entire episode and uh and y y there's nothing you can do about it but uh, yeah it's been a it's been crazy. Alex has been super, uh, super kind to me. Recently, he was supposed to be here for a Halloween episode, and uh, I was so excited to have Alex on and release the second part to the Solomonic Magic introduction. And then I woke up, I felt great, and then an hour before I was going to talk to Alex, I got really ill. I got very sick. And uh, my, my girlfriend was like, you're not recording. I was like, I'm going to record. I'm, I was doing that thing where you know, there might as well have been blood gushing out of the side of my, my, my torso. And I was like, no, I can go on. Oh. I can do it. Don't you worry about me. And the, the girlfriend was like, you're absolutely not recording Douglas. So uh, Alex was kind enough to, to be like, you know what, Doug, uh, let's do this at a, a later date. So I'm super happy to have you back here, Alex. And I love everything you do, man. Your, your recent episodes are so great. It just, it's so fascinating each and every time you bring on certain guests, like, <sighs> 
I don't want to give away too much because uh, I, I am a member of your Patreon, and so I get to see things that are coming up, and it's just so exciting that I want to like tell everybody, and I forget that everybody that's a patron of mine isn't a patron of yours, so I have to be like, oh shit, I should probably not mention this because, but I'm just always so excited, and, and particularly there's uh, two episodes coming up uh, from when everybody listens to this, two episodes coming up on the Glitch Bottle, but seriously, everybody too bad about the praise i'm gonna keep peeping it and definitely if you do not listen to glitch bottle it's the great in my opinion it is the greatest podcast on magic that we have right now and it's such a fantastic show so uh too bad listeners and uh <laughs> listeners listening who haven't listened to glitch bottle what's keeping you because you got ahead there and so thank you again alex for for joining me today Oh, Douglas, come on now. I, I can't let you say all that without without returning the favor because um, I am honored to be one of your patrons as well. And I have to say, the content, the guests, the different angles that you approach things, I think in, in, in an age in which it sometimes feels like drinking from an esoteric fire hose, yeah. I think it's so wonderful that, th- that you are able to parse things out and kind of and, and really break things down in, in a very succinct way, but also in a way that goes deep into the topics. And so I also like the, the, um, the variation that you have too, whether it's different guests or different content, it's just, it's, it's, I think much needed in today's day and age as well. So I, I am, the honor is mine, Douglas. So yeah, listeners, I'm sorry. Uh, the the praise will be continued. Right. I mean, I'm really not, I'm just saying that (laughs) to save face, but, but it's not working obviously. Um, but yeah, it's just an honor to be here. Amazing. So we had, you on earlier talking about Solomonic magic, this thing that you love and that many an episode of Glitch Bottle is, is hinged around and this thing that I love as well. And I was so happy to have you on talking about that. We got halfway through the question, so I had to get you back on. So this is going to be part two, everybody. And I really hope you enjoy it because there's some things that we're going to talk about here. We kind of finished up last episode, a little bit of a refresher. We finished up talking about the uh, what we called the Solomonic Method. Went through all of those as far as it regards to the grimoire that was released, I think, two years ago called The Elucidation of Necromancy or The Elucidation. Chidarium, uh, which was put out by Joseph H. Peterson. If everybody hasn't picked up a copy yet, please go and grab that. It was wonderful. I've picked up a copy since then. It's craziness. It's such an interesting grimoire and document. And in one of these days, I would love to do a Patreon episode about it, a deep dive on it, because it really is very fascinating. We talked about it in the episode. And then we had a little bit of a conversation about um, whether or not the Heptameron, which is a kind of like, it's, it's the it's the bastardized version of the elucidation of necromancy. I think I hope I'm not being too cruel by saying that, but um, anyhow, not at all, not at all. That is a perfect summation of it. I okay, absolutely. And we did, and then we talked about you know like is it okay to maybe fiddle a little bit with with grimoires? And you said you know what that's baked into the grimoires. They say like this is the one way of doing things, but they also say do it until it works. And that's where we left off. I had to pull the. Uh, the uh, the stop cord the uh, the trolley cord and and and, and get everybody off because we talked for about two and a half hours so uh, these are the rest of the questions that I'm going to have for you Alex so let's start with uh, something a bit more textual so let's talk about the clavicula Alex what is if, if somebody who has never tuned into any kind of a, a magical podcast and somebody says the clavicula what are they talking about. Ha, that's a fantastic question. And yes, uh, for someone who's who's listening for the first time or maybe finding out about this, the clavicula salomonis, or the which is Latin for the key of Solomon, is the title of one of the most, probably the most famous or infamous, if you will, of grimoires, of these uh, collections of magician handbooks that detail rituals and procedures and materia magica, things that you need to summon an appropriate spirit. And so the clavicula salamanus is uh, much, many listeners might be familiar with the current version of the clavicula if they check out versions that are recent, much like they would be familiar with something you and I, Douglas, talked about last time with the Lamegatons Goetia, because about a hundred years ago or so, uh, Mathers, who we discussed in the last episode as well, in 1889, uh, made a translation of the Clavicula Salomonis, but 
just like the Lamegaton, which we discussed, the manuscript tradition of the actual clavicula goes back seven, eight, nine hundred years in terms of source material. And so the earliest reference that we have to this book, uh, this manuscript, as you say, and I know we'll uh, hopefully discuss some of the details of the of the book itself. One of the earliest references to the Clavicula Salomonis, or this Key of Solomon, is in the early 1300s, actually, from the actual Peter de Abano. And as you touched on, Douglas, the uh, author of the Heptameron, a.k.a. the Elucidarium, or the Elucidation of Necromancy Grimoire, is allegedly Peter de Abano, right. uh, the you know Italian um, physician and, and who, someone who was actually on trial a few times for magic. Um, but they never really, you know, proved anything concretely with that connection. So it's pseudo de Abano. And so it's the early 1300s was when this shows up. The oldest manuscript known at this point is an Italian manuscript dated in, in the mid 1400s. So about 600 years ago. And so this book is very, very large uh, because it has so many different chapters. And the book contains everything from how to consecrate and prepare ink to how to use the blood of a bat to how to prepare a, a sword to a quill to gloves and shoes. I mean, depending on the manuscript, there's so many different things that it talks about, but also just voluminous conjurations to the spirits and the appropriate use of incense and pentacles, which I know uh, you've discussed and, and I've discussed as well. Entire sections in the grimoire laying out every day of the week, the planetary days and each day having pentacles associated with Venus and Mars and the moon and all of the traditional classical planets. And so this was a really influential grimoire, this Clavicula Salamanis. And there's another grimoire that really informed or helped provide a lot of the source material from the uh, or into the Clavicula Salamanis, which would be the Greek grimoire, the Magical Treatise of Solomon, that I know you and I have discussed, uh, Douglas, as well, also known as the Hygromantia, or as I was recently corrected, the Hygromantia, uh, is the true ancestor, one of, one of the major sources of this Key of Solomon. So the Key of Solomon is European, uh, quote-unquote, meaning Western Europe, but the Greek grimoire, obviously the Hygromantia, or Hygromantia, has a lot of different uh, differences, but similarities that feed into what we see in the Latin manuscript itself. So we can definitely get into all of that. But uh, yeah. but yeah, that's just a fascinating book. Sure. Do you think that the reason it's is pop because we have more copies of what we can when we squint and look at these documents of what we would call claviculas or keys of Solomon? Do you think that just because it is so so big and so varied because because yeah, there's there's all of the ways of creating the instruments. There's all of these pentacles or and talism and or talismans, magic circles for certain days, and all of these kind of. Do you think that it's because it it's so typical of a specific kind of style of grimoire that it's it, that it was just copied like crazy? But it, because the documents themselves, I know this sounds so trite. The documents themselves, they just look so magical. And if you've see, you can scroll through, there's there's more than a hundred of them uploaded digitally that you can look at. And a lot of them do look very similar, but they also have like interesting little flourishes to them. Do you just think it's because they the magic within the books themselves, it's sorry, the the diagrams and the way the book is presented is just so magical looking that that's why it's as popular. Or do you just think it's because it's so versatile because it just covers so many bases? Oh yeah. I mean, I think it's a little combination of both because you're right. It's, it's, it's a complete system. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that, that you see in the clavicula or the key of Solomon that many other grimoires, you know, if you pick up a grimoire, uh, you know, for example, the Lamegaton's Goetia, well, that's very complete, but there are certain things in, for instance, in the uh, spiritual hierarchies that are left out um, in the Heptameron, as, as you were sharing about, there are several things that seem to have been changed over the centuries and there might be some pieces missing or some explanations that need to be filled in. But yeah, I, I think when it comes to the key of Solomon, it truly is a complete system because it really walks you through literally from your very first item that you make, you know, 
uh, exercising and blessing salt and making holy water, which right. you can do on your own. And then, and then, you know, getting the aspergillum and, and understanding about how to consecrate and then using those to then, you know, consecrate incense. And I, I think you're right. I think it's, it's that it, it was such an influential grimoire, but also it was hitting at just the right time because right. Right in the, and I know this is something you've discussed as well a lot, right in that kind of, you know, 1100s, 1200s in European history, you just have Europe becomes this repository of Greek and Arabic and Jewish texts that are just flowing into Europe, uh, either through Spain or through the monks that are constant, there's almost this migration of monks from the crumbling Byzantine empire at the time going into Europe. And so bringing with them a lot of these sources like the Hygromantia. And so I think you're right. You see right when it hits all of this material flowing in and then the key of Solomon coming out of that is this kind of condensed in, in, in some ways compared to the Greek sources, but also adding new things as well compared to the Greek sources that just flourishes. And of course the manuscript tradition passing, you know, from hand to hand and, you know, monks, uh, you know, very clandestinely copying specific manuscripts um, under mid literally burning the candles stick at both ends, if you will, to right. try and, and get that done. So yeah, it was just a really fascinating time. I think uh, yeah. in European history. I don't want to dwell on it too long, but it's it's kind of interesting. So when when we're talking right now, listener, and I know everybody is super excited about this kind of magic and and whatnot, and they might want to run to the store and, and pick up or order from Amazon, pick up a, a key of Solomon. They're very different. Clavicules are very, very different. So can you talk a little bit, and let's just use three that would be somewhat familiar to us in, say, a document uh, released by... Stephen Skinner and David Rankine, as known as the Veritable Key of Solomon. Uh, it's not just one book. So they've got three different kinds of keys of Solomon in there. I believe it's the Rabbi Solomon, there is the Colorno Key of Solomon, and then there's Universal, Universal Treaties Solomon. Why are there different kinds of, we don't have to go into all the distinct differences between them, uh, but why is there such a variation in the kinds of claviculas, do you think? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. It's a very it's a very complex answer because <laughs> um, you know I I know for example uh, if if the listeners check out uh, exactly Dr. Stephen Skinner David Rankin's book if they go on esotericarchives.com by yeah. the wonderful Joseph Peterson and and you'll see Peterson trace the pedigrees of these mm. of these manuscripts and you're right what'll what'll happen in, in many times is you'll have one manuscript, say manuscript A, that'll come in, you know, it's created in Italy in 1355 or something like that. And that's manuscript A. However, you might have manuscript A then gets copied and it gets, you know, distributed in say 20 different versions, but those have slight variations in them. And someone who's, you know, looking at the seventh variation of that, they might take it and they might go, ah, this is great. I'm going to copy this hundred percent, but I'm also going to add in some material from this other manuscript I have. So that, that could be one potential source of a variation, but the other one could be that new material continues to come in. And so for instance, something I know you've discussed, Douglas, is when we think of the quote unquote Solomonic tradition, we think of, you know, pseudo Solomon, of, of course, King Solomon, who lived in, you know, 900 before the common era, did not, you know, very, 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 very likely, obviously did not write these, but you have everyone using pseudo Solomon to do that. And all of a sudden you might have someone who says, ah, well, this is this is a key of Solomon. And so this material, it might be very similar to some of the other manuscripts, but it might be, it might be different in many ways, but it still gets the name of the key. Yeah. And so I think you might see that one of, one of the uh, other versions is the secret of, uh, or the uh, key of Solomon. And it is on esotericarchives.com. I know Joseph Peterson has a version of it, but it's, it's with the key of Solomon via uh, this kind of telemic, uh, source and it's an English key of Solomon. It's not even Latin. Yeah. And yeah. that's just so fascinating too, yeah, because yeah. It, it's, it's almost as if someone in England in 1560, they were right looking at a Latin translation and then they were make turning it, you know, tr translating it into English. But even then Douglas, you're right. There's material in there that has 
you know, demonic procedures or ways to evoke specific spirits that are not in any of the other manuscripts. <laughs> so it's wild. It's, it's wild. It's wild. It's, it could be ma- maddening as well for um, for people, and it yes. might take a little bit of research. I'm just going to give my my two cents here. I love the Abram Colorno uh, Keys of Solomon. Uh, that's listed as as key two within the veritable Key of Solomon. It's it's mainly involving spirit evocation. I think that that's, it's, it's really wonderful. The, um, the Rabbi Solomon is a lot of pentacles and things of that nature and talismans and things like that. The Kalorni, I think just the, the Klorno Kalorni, he's given a bunch of different names and he's an incredible character as well. If you don't know, he's kind of like a, a pseudo Indiana Jones before his time, really interesting character also brought up in another book. Oh my God, I'm going to look at my bookshelf, the age of secrecy. Great book talks about a Abraham Calorno, but I just think that for people who are interested in claviculas, don't assume that every clavicula is going to be the same. There's so many different runs in my house, so it gets so maddening. Uh, but a good place to start would certainly be uh, the Veritable Key of Solomon, as well as Joseph H. Peterson's. Uh, the is it just called the Clavis, or I forget the name of his translation. Yes, uh, I, I I don't know the specific. It's not coming to mind his specific publication or translation, but I do know on ex- esotericarchives.com, yeah. you can see his uh, the the Mathers version of the Key of yes. Solomon he has up there, as well as the English Key of Solomon, for example, that we discussed too. So that you're right, it's 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 interesting because you can compare those and just see. Okay, there's some similarities, but there's also a lot of differences here. So yeah, yeah. it is like drinking from a fire hose at times, and so. I love your advice, Douglas, which is exactly just, you you might feel really excited. I'm going to run to the bookstore. I'm going to read all of the different keys and that's great. But in terms of practice, maybe just exactly sticking with one and just kind of going through that would be really great as well. And I know uh, someone we've discussed before, Aaron Leach, uh, he has a book called The Secrets of the Magical Grimoires, Yes, where he literally walks through, I believe it's the Mathers edition, but because it can be kind of complex, but he'll walk through like, okay, step one here is what you do with the salt and the water, and here's what you do. Step two, and it just kind of eases you into that as well, which I think can also be very helpful too. Definitely. I don't want to make, I can't, I keep saying this, and we're already 22 minutes in. I don't want to make too much of this, but when you say Le Megaton, the clavicula, Le Megaton, it's given it's so many different things. What What is the difference between the key of Solomon and the lesser key of Solomon? Just as quick as we can, because people are yes. people would would confuse the lesser key as being a key in and of itself, and it kind of is, but it also kind of isn't at the same time. So, what is Le Megaton or the lesser key of Solomon? Uh, so that's that's a fantastic question. So the the short Spark Notes version. Uh, as it rattles around in my very error-filled brain, is the following. The uh, Lamegaton Le- is a collection of five books all bundled under one title, which is called the Lamegaton. The, the name Lamegaton, it's kind of an inaccurate name, but it, it, it almost is known as like the little key. Like it's, it's, it's if someone took this kind of misshaped Latin um, layer of, I'm going to call this the little key. What would that sound? Like? Oh, La Megaton. Like, okay. <laughs> um, like, so that is known as the little key. That book or that collection of five books has the famous or well-known uh, 72 spirits in the first of the five books of the Megaton called the Goetia. It also has in the second book, uh, a hundreds of aerial spirits uh, in the Theurgia Goetia as well. And it has three other books, which actually tie into a later discussion we can get into too about the Arsenatoria and these beautiful prayers that are used for communion with angels. So that specific thing is the Lamegaton, whereas, which is known as the little key of Solomon, However, the quote-unquote greater key of Solomon is exactly what you were discussing, which is the clavicula Salomonis. This is that full, it has consecrations and blessings for everything from ink to needles to swords. It has a ton of conjurations that just span in Latin and Italian and English and French. As you said, Douglas, so many different editions. And that is known as the greater key of Solomon. So even though the two might seem like they're linked and they are linked as you said in some ways there's there's not 
a ton of things that are common between them. Like they should be linked. They are, they are very separate in many ways too. Yeah. Yeah, certainly this, if, if you're looking for exactly that, those 72 demons that everybody who comes to magic initially, they absolutely love, you will not find any of those. Well, some of the names are somewhat similar. We can talk about that later, but uh, (laughs) the 72 conjuring one demon at a time stuff, that is in the Lesser Key of Solomon, the Lamegaton. So um, yes. don't <laughs> I don't want anybody I don't want people getting their their Solomonic grimoires mixed up. Uh, but I will say this: as cool as the seventy two is, you need if Solomonic magic is interesting to you, I would suggest and recommend picking up an actual clavicula first and just looking at that, looking at the shape of them. Alex is right; they have a process, which is what makes them very interesting. And we did talk about the Solomonic Solomonic method in the last episode. But what also these books have, which is very interesting in a lot of these grimoires, is they have these other things in there. There's not just conjuring spirits. A lot of times they will have what are listed by the writers or the copyists going through these grimoires are experiments. And they actually, a lot of times, they just call them experiments. So let's uh, let's talk about this because this is also it is Solomonic magic. It's not just doing things and, and spirit evocation by the Solomonic method. There's these other things. So let's talk about a few of them. We don't need to spend a ton of time on them, but uh, there's what is called obtaining a peridros. What is a peridros, Alex? Yes. Yeah, so a peridros um, is effectively an operation that is found in the grimoire tradition to acquire a magical assistant or a magical servant, to use the older term. And this is seen uh, in the Testament of, Sol- of Solomon, which many people might consider to going way, way, way back about 1800 years ago. It is considered to be the first grimoire, if you will, because it was written around 200, 300 uh, in the common era. And that Testament of Solomon involves the binding of one demon by Solomon, who in turn, once that demon was bound by Solomon in this story, or pseudo Solomon, that demon offered advice that was used to bind other demons. And so this this aspect about using one spirit that can answer information and aid the magician, aid the operator, the practitioner in the acquisition of other spirits, this seemed to carry over into the idea of witches and magicians having what's known, of course, as many people might be familiar, a familiar spirit. Yes. You know, I'd certainly recommend the work of someone like B.J. Swain, who's done great work on familiar spirits to delve more into that area. But we also see that in a side way, when it comes to obtaining a paridros, you have this kind of, you know, magical assistant that does carry over into the grimoire tradition in the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s. And it's also linked as well with this idea of what's known as a thwarting angel or a spirit that is over, say, one other spirit, uh, just like we see in the Key of Solomon, where, or excuse me, in the uh, uh, the Testament of Solomon from about 1800 years ago, where you have, I am so-and-so demon, and I am bound by X angel, and yeah. I, am, I am this demon of sickness, and I am bound by this angel. And so there's this relationship there. So that I, obtaining a peridros or a magical assistant That can help you not only, as Dr. Alexander Cummins says, you know, do better magic to get better results, to feed better magic, to do better results, and just kind of have this, you know, positive Ouroboros, if you will, of efficacy. But it's also linked to that kind of thwarting angel aspect to have this this hierarchical structure that can help you find a magical assistant or servant that you can work with. Amazing. Great answer. Yeah, it's... I love the name Peridros. Everybody else would just call them familiars, and 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 it's and it's it's really quite a, an interesting aspect that that a lot, I think a lot of people would think that it was just it's just witchcraft based, but it's got its it's got its its or I wouldn't know save exactly if it's got its origins in Solomonic magic, but it is just a different uh, manifestation of of this kind of idea of having, uh, yeah, you create kind of like a, a little assistant to help you with with everything you do. It's it's really quite fascinating. Something that I had a chance to talk to. Um, one of the authors of the veritable or editors of the veritable key of Solomon, David Rankin is something that is very bizarre in some grimoires. You can use them for obtaining a, a lover. And in, in the episode I had him on, a, the lover happened to be a kind of fairy. But that's not just only the only thing that exists within grimoires is that there's a lot of love spells in, in these Solomonic grimoires. What's up with that, Alex? 
Oh yeah, that is that that goes right back, Douglas and and yourself and David Rankin exactly articulate this so well that that goes right back to the very practical magic that we find 2000 years ago in the Greco Egyptian magical papyri. And so love spells, the acquisition of, of capturing someone's attention, getting someone to fall in love with you that goes way back to the Greco Egyptian magical papyri. We find that in the Greek sources, we were talking about the, the hygromantia or the hygromantia earlier as well. And what's interesting about the love spells, which sounds you know, just saying love spell, I'm, I'm thinking of like some corny 1970s right. TV show where it's like a dating show. But yeah. it, as, as you know, it was quite the opposite. These were considered the language used in these spells. It's very coercive. It's very harsh. You know, may this person fall in love with me. And if not, may they not be able to eat, sleep, drink or anything until they submit to my will. Right. And it's just a, a very interesting way of. Looking, especially now, we look back, we go, oh my gosh, like, how, how is this even allowed? Like, how did this happen? But you are right that the acquisition of love or lust or physical attention or the, you know, to, to draw a lover to you, absolutely, along with the acquisition of wealth, power, damaging an enemy, uh, looking good in front of judges and being able to win the approval of people in power, those five or six things are among the top, very material-based interests in the practical use of the grimoires, for sure. Yeah. Something else I find very uh, – I'm sorry, we're just people – we have to just keep skipping like these. I'd love to keep responding to everything that Alex is saying, but I'm just looking at my questions right now. I'm like, oh my god, there's so much to go through. But something that is long-tenured within even the stories that we have from things like the figure of Solomon and the creation of his temple, and there's a variation. I forget who it was that was talking about it. It might have been Josephus. Oh, oh, wait, no, I think actually it was uh, a document found in the uh, the Nag Hammadi library talking about how Solomon was able to capture spirits in water vessels. And that is that eventually he took these vessels and um, th- they, they stayed there until Roman soldiers broke them open. And that's why we have spirits and that's why we can conjure them through things like the Ars Goetia and whatnot. But something that it does exist in a lot of uh, Solomonic magic grimoires, I'm just going to say that specifically, are imprisoning spirits. Why, what, what's, so we, we, have, we can get Peridros and helpers, but what is this other thing in which we're, we're capturing spirits and keeping them in certain things? What's going on with this, Alex? Yeah, that's that's a fantastic question, Douglas. And that that's a major um, Solomonic technique. And I know last podcast we were chatting about the things that are hallmark Solomonic. And so the way that spirits are engaged within the grimoires, as you so excellently touched on, is that there is this language that is used um, that is very can be very gentle and can be very inviting. We actually see that in the in the key of Solomon, but it can also be coercive and it it can be, you know, saying to the spirit, I have this divine authority to bind you. And so spirits are bound. Uh, and we will talk a little bit about what binding means, but briefly, in the grimoires, spirits are summoned, they are conjured, they are evoked if they are uh, more demonic or sublunar or chthonic spirits. And when they are evoked, you have to, in the Solomonic procedure and the Solomonic system, uh, one of the very common things is you must locate the spirit in a specific item. And so we see either a spirit being located in a floor triangle that's drawn outside of the circle, as we see in the Lamegaton's Goetia, or we'll see the spirits that are located or, you know, kind of invited if they're angelic or not, if they are, you know, more sublunar into a crystal sphere or a, a crystal ball, which actually is not just angelic in, in its use, but also has chthonic use as well. Or to your point, Douglas, Yes, in the Lamegatons Goetia, there's literally a brazen, a brass vessel that is used that the magician must create. And I, I know you've spoken with magicians who are practitioners of Solomonic magic, and and in my experience and the people I've spoken with, the spirits are bound there, meaning they are temporarily located there for a face-to-face or a question and answer period, so that the magician can accurately relay the request or the petition to the spirit. However, the spirit is not 
necessarily, and this depends on what tradition that you're talking yeah. about, is not necessarily bound there forever. In mm-hmm. fact, the as you and I were chatting about in the last episode, the very last step number six of the Solomonic procedure is the licentia, the license to depart. And so the spirit is given license to return to the area in whence it came. However, the really great thing is once that initial connection is made, the spirit comes much more readily. And so these vessels, these brass vessels, these crystals, these floor triangles are all spiritus loci or ways that you can focus the spirit temporarily as you ask it or suggest a petition for it. Yeah, it's incredibly fascinating stuff. And and it's one of those things where a lot of people, this is translated into a lot of great works of fiction. And like, so this is like, this is a trope, (laughs) but it's, but it has a tenure to it. It's got, it's got, it's got an actual lineage through these incredible documents. And I just find, as you know, I just, this is, this is my stuff. This is my jam. I would like to talk a little bit about it because this, because it's, I find it very interesting in the, the, uh, the translator of the magical treaties of Solomon or the Hygromantia or Hygromantia wrote a wonderful article and it'll be in the show notes for this. Something else in these grimoires, another experiment that they have, and they have lots of them. There's experiments in for like changing weather. Really, people pick up some keys of Solomon, go through them, read the whole thing. It's really fascinating. But one of them is invisibility. Why would invisibility be a thing to people, say, five, four or five hundred years ago? What's up with that? Oh, Douglas, I find this super interesting. Yes, because as you mentioned with the Hygromantia, the Hygromantia, there is this emphasis on invisibility or keeping things concealed. And whether that's an individual, whether that's an item, there there seems to be this desire, this practical desire, just as we were talking about for the acquisition of love or damaging an enemy. Well, people want to keep things hidden and it might be themselves. And so I think that this feeds a very practical need just from a, a kind of human nature dealing with, I have this thing that's happening. I, I need help from the spiritual world. So, so the demand was certainly there for various reasons. But you're right. In the Hygromantia, as you were talking about, there's an operation for, for example, using a human skull yes. as part of an invisibility rite. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting, right? Because as Dr. Skinner says, this isn't typical of the Solomonic tradition. No. But it but it survives in the grimoireum verum, yes. you know, <laughs> and it's so fantastic because I, I, I'm sure you, you, just like me, Douglas, you know, I, I was blown away finding out, okay, well, how does this work? Well, in the verum, you, you literally plant beans or bean beans seeds yes. in the orifice of a skull. Yeah. <laughs> and then after a time period and reciting the appropriate conjurations, whoever carries those beans that are then removed from the skull is granted invisibility. And so... Dr. Skinner mentions that this could be a throwback to the Greco-Egyptian magical papyri from Mm. 2000 years ago because some rites required you do the right, you execute the right actually in a bean field. And so beans carry on this fascinating thing with the underworld, which is different from like, I remember when I was growing up, you hear about Jack and the beanstalk. It's like, wait, beans go up, like, but I guess they go down here. So it's just an interesting connection there. I also think find it fascinating, and I I wish somebody would do a little bit more research. But the the Roman, and this might be a bit of a tangent, the Roman festival of Lemuria, in which it, it, it's dealing with spirits of the dead, spirits of dead ancestors, the rites themselves to coerce the spirits, they'd use beans, and the beans are specifically talked about, or this, they're talked about as being invisible beings, and they just the equation of invisible beans, and it's just like, <laughs> is yes. it's, is it a coincidence? I don't really know. So yeah, it's very fascinating i forget if the are i'm not sure are the beans present in the higromantia i don't think they are i don't if memory serves i don't think the beans are no. directly present i don't believe so there is a human skull as yes. part of an invisibility yeah. right yeah. um but I, I don't know if the beans are present yeah. there but i'd have to check uh. We have to keep moving on. There's so much other stuff to talk about. Here's something that is, I think, is somewhat neglected in conversations with people that like Solomonic magic. And it's we're starting to look at it a little bit more here because uh, it is a very, very important aspect of magic. It was back in the day. I find it incredibly fascinating. It feeds that wonderful, you know, that 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 little Indiana Jones that we have in each and every one of these these uh, ceremonial or Solomonic magicians, and that is the acquisition 
of treasure. A lot of the Solomonic grimoires, and I'm not just talking about claviculas, I'm talking about a lot of grimoires that we can say has the Solomonic method in it. There is something there about finding treasure. What is going on with the treasure stuff, Alex? I know. I I also find this so fascinating too, Douglas. And I love how Dr. Skinner phrases this, which is like, before the banking system, people right. needed to bury treasure. And I never thought of it that way. I yeah. was like, oh yeah. If you have, you know, a bunch of, you know, 10,000 gold bullions, right? Like right. you can't just go to your local bank and deposit them. Like you actually yeah. have to bury it. So yeah, this is fascinating. People had buried treasure. Buried treasure is not just for pirate movies. It actually is a thing and people had it and they they wanted to keep it. Much like as you were discussing, Douglas, the invisibility, right? They Well, they wanted to keep treasure hidden when they buried it. But then of course spirits uh, can be employed by a curious magician to acquire a buried treasure. And so we do see, we see in the grimoire tradition, many different examples of this in the Greek hygromantia. There's a procedure to find buried treasure using the four archangels and other angels to get demonic spirits to locate the treasure. And so here we see an interesting hierarchical command structure that's being used where uh, archangels are used saying, hey, in the name of these archangels, please find the treasure. Interestingly, there's a request by the magician that the spirit, when it does find treasure and bring it back to the magician, that it doesn't bring back illusory gold. Right. <laughs> it's the name of a band, illusory gold. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a, it's like a ska band. From right. 1997. We <laughs> We're old enough yeah. to remember ska being popular again. Both oh, yeah. Ska's, oh, oh, Ska's not popular. I'm sorry. Never, never mind. Don't look at my playlist at home. Don't look oh. at my playlist at home. It's fine. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, it is it is certainly a lost uh, genre. But we see that. We see Don't Bring Back Illusory Gold. Right. You know, we also see an interesting thing that I know many listeners are familiar with, uh, even in pop culture, which is the Key of Solomon has a procedure for finding buried treasure by employing gnomes. Gnomes! So, That's right. Yes, and, Gnomes, I know. And it's fascinating since gnomes have kind of taken on this, you know, at least in pop culture, this Disney-esque fantasy status. But for magicians working the key, these spirits are vital for revealing treasure that they guard. And it's based also on if there are good, if you as the magician are looking for buried treasure and you're you're working with gnomes, if you have a good relationship with the gnomes, that's an interesting thing that's kind of discussed, that, you, that it's not just hectoring and ordering, but you have to have a relationship. There's also finding gold and treasure, Douglas, this concept of astrological timing, you know, with, yeah. with procedures. So when the moon is in, you know, there's a diacal sign of Leo, then you must, you know, draw a circle and you must use a sword as a precaution. And it's just fascinating. I, I believe in one grimoire, there is a visual representation, or it might've been a popular rendition at the time where magicians have spirits that they're asking to bring gold, but the magicians are digging inside the circle itself, the circle, which yeah. is so fascinating. It's not something you would you would expect. And then the final thing I would say on this, and this, I, I know Douglas and area you're very familiar with, and it's something that blew me away. Um, when I was reading, uh, I believe Skinner sharing about this, but that the great angel magician, uh, John D in the late 1500s actually asked queen Elizabeth the first for a Royal warrant, right. allowing him to secure for himself, any treasure trove he might discover with the aid from the spirits, because, you know, fighting treasure in that way was totally illegal at that time. Like you actually had to ask permission from royalty to do that. So that just blew me away too. It's fascinating though as well, because D himself, um, whether he did it or his son did it, part of D's manuscripts were buried. He buried his prized manuscripts. It's so weird for us to think now, because again, these things have become tropes of fiction and storytelling, but they actually were real things. People buried stuff all the time. Yes. <laughs> and, and it was, and it was just something that we did. And so of course there was people that were like, well, magically we can get the assistance of spirits to help us out. William Lilly, the, the astrologer talks about him being part of a treasure hunt in Westminster Abbey in 1634. That, and it's an incredible story. 
this also leads me to perhaps one of my because it's so rife for comedy and 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 hilariousness. But one of my favorite releases in the last five years is a book by uh, Frank Clausen and Sharon Hubbs Wright called um, "The Magic of Rogues," in which it talks about two very specific uh, instances in which uh, magical documents were used and people were engaging in magic, and then they had to go to court for them. But the very first one is a group of people that were treasure hunting. What they do in this book is they show you what what grimoires they used for the treasure hunting. And yes. the assistance of the fairy Oberon, and it's just it's this is incredibly fascinating stuff. And I really hope one of these days I can do a, I can do a full episode on magical treasure hunting. But it's something that we've kind of lost. And people that would do say Solomonic treasure hunting now, it's uh, it's an interesting one. Uh, it's it's one that I'd like to to explore, but. It's it's is a huge part of of Solomonic magic, and in fact, there's a book by Johann Dillinger called "Magical Treasure Hunting in Europe and North America," worth looking out. Again, uh, no magical treasure hunting in grimoires. You don't have Mormonism. Truly, you don't have yeah. Joseph Smith. He was he used grimoire treasure hunting. That was what he did, right? So this stuff is very very big. I'd like to shift, if I may, unless you have something to say more about about treasure hunting as well. I mean, I just think it's. It's the coolest stuff. It's so fascinating, and and it, it just appeals to this part of me, Alex. That's like, yeah, you know, maybe someday I'll do it big. I did. I've done magic. I've done magic treasure hunting or, or rituals, and of course, you know, I don't find anything. But um, I will just say, fun fun stuff happens while it, while you're doing it. It's kind of like, oh, that's a oh yeah, that's a neat little circumstance. But it's yeah, it's a weird one. <laughs> no, it's it is it is it's it's fascinating, and I I think the only thing that I. I I could add to that. That was so great is, you know, people, of course, the, the needs from day to day haven't changed. So people are still looking for the acquisition of wealth, but what we're seeing now, at least from, from some of the guests who I've spoken with and, and my own experience and looking at the grimoires is for example, you know, working with a mercurial spirit to find a winning combination to the lottery or working with a, you have a job interview coming up. So you work with a jovial spirit or a solar spirit to look more magnanimous and kind of carry this gravitas with you that impresses people. So you're right. Whereas comma, the old school treasure hunting is very much like, okay, we are after the gold coins. That's what we need right now. So yeah. I love it. <laughs> oh man. So good. Uh, what's interesting about Solomonic magic as well, and if we're looking at something, say, like the Hegromantia or the Magical Treaties of Solomon, uh, there is a lot of what we could call evocatory scrying, whether that's using the assistance of, of a young boy to look into a fingernail or to look into a basin of water. But for some reason, from the Magical Treaties of Solomon or the Hegromantia, for some reason, this kind of scrying, it doesn't really make its way into the clavicula. So so what do you think is happening here? Because I, I think I think uh, you would agree with me that scrying, you can use scrying, and it has been used in scrying, is part of the Solomonic method as a way of receiving the, the visual appearance of a spirit within a crystal. Why do you think that just the, the claviculas, they didn't have this kind of stuff? Yeah. I mean, it, it seems like when you look at the clavicula, I mean, heck, when you look at the heptameron uh, and the elucidarium necromanciae, there's there's almost this assumption that the magician is will be able to perceive the spirits. And it says, you know, like here, are the like, for instance, in the clavicula, to your point, you know, here are the conjurations. And when the spirits arrive, you know, say thus and thus, or in the heptameron, right? When you're issuing the vinculum Salomonis or the, the chain or bond of Solomon, which is this long string of divine names, you know, and then afterwards, when you are later on in the ritual, the spirits will manifest, you know, as minstrels and beating drums and they'll try and scare the assistants out of the circle. So you're right. There seems to be, as, as best as I can tell, almost an assumption built in that the spirits will be somehow perceptible. But you're right that just like invisibility, it seems in some capacity uh, from the kind of, say, Greek tradition um, into the European Western, quote unquote, Solomonic tradition, it seems to have fallen out. But as you touched on, Douglas, in the early 1800s, for example, you know, the grimoire drawing spirits into crystals, you know, it, it says, quote, in these dealings, two people should always be present for often a spirit is manifest to one in the crystal when the other cannot perceive him. Therefore, if any spirit appear as most likely will to one or both say such and such and welcome the spirit. And so 
we see the scryer there, but also 300 years before that, we have scryers like, as you mentioned, Kelly working crystallomantic operations with the famous Elizabethan magician, astrologer, and spy, John D. And so you're right. I think it might be an assumption, but there's no doubt that in addition to us, even if you assume it, in the grimoire tradition, it does seem to indicate that some people will have a better scrying ability or sight than than others. And Douglas, correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't part of the key of Solomon, Yeah, doesn't it say that uh, if you don't have any companions, use a dog. Use a dog yeah. to detect things. <laughs> yeah. So that's always something that <laughs> might be an option. I, I I don't want to confuse people further because we just finished talking about how there's many different keys of Solomon. Uh, there's right. there's a couple of keys of the Lamegaton as well. There's something known as the Goetia of Doctor Rudd that does this other really cool thing, and I talked about it in my Goetia episode where the thwarting angels are back. The seventy two angels of the Shemham Forash are are in coordination with the 72 demons of the Goetia. There's a lot of speculation, and I don't want to get too much into the speculation as to whether or not Thomas Rudd was a real person or whether he existed before John D or when as a contemporary of John D or whatnot. I think he was more, or whoever put this grimoire together was influenced by John D. I think there's a couple of um, a couple of indicators of this. If you took a look at that document, it seems like the way in which that this Goetia is interacted with this specific Ars Goetia is interacting with is through scrying. That the brazen vessel itself is literally like a kind of lamen, which is very interesting and very weird. But it, I think it's assumed that your interaction is done using a crystal or a show stone in order to interact with the, the spirits of the Goetia, which has got that that D like in that English D like influence in it. Totally, totally. And I believe the Goetia of Dr. Ed has mention of both the triangle and the crystal, as well as, of course, the uh, amazing, amazing, beautiful, like Peter Smart, 1712, a, a beautiful image of the brass vessel itself. And so, yeah, that's it, it is really interesting to see how that changed or evolved in like the 1600s and 1700s. It's absolutely yeah. fascinating. Yeah. There's a whole can of worms that we can open up about about whether or not I'm there's this, to hold gr- back. This, this group of like angel magicians that might have been around with John D and, and who exactly Thomas Rudd might have been one person, two people, father, son. Like it it gets a little bit dicey, but someday right. <laughs> someday perhaps I'll we'll I'll talk about it on, on the Patreon. I have to ask you this. Alex, how do you define Goetia? Goetia really goes back to antiquity. And so for me, I define in the Solomonic tradition, I define goetic operations as operations where the magician is dealing with spirits that are not celestial, considered celestial. They're not considered terrestrial in the sense of like an aerial spirit, but they are spirits that are considered sublunar or chthonic spirits. And those, those terms are very specific and we can, we can kind of parse those out, but you know, it really goes back to antiquity. And I know it's something you've discussed as well. When you think of the goes or, you know, howling or funeral rites in ancient Greece and the burying of the dead. And then how this translated into, uh, calling the dead, guiding the dead and Jake Stratton Kent, I think, may he rest in peace uh, in his wonderful Geosophia book, says, quote, there is a continuity of practice in the West which encompasses the pre-Olympian cults of Dionysus. It's found in the Greek magical papyri and the Picatrix, and it flows into the grimoires. And he says, rather than a muddle of superstition, the grimoire tradition is revealed as the living descendant of the ancient practice of the goes. And so this is a very specific kind of spirit that we're looking at here. Um, Frater Acher, uh, who is based in Munich, Germany, in his Clavicula Goetica book, details ways that, quote, this key to the underworld, and again, this kind of goetic underworld, these spirits, it's a living being, a spirit in its own right that only comes to life when magic is performed as an act of co-creation of equals, showing a path more towards balanced approach of magic. So I think that's an interesting way to think about Goetia in terms of dealing with a certain class of non-celestial, non-terrestrial spirits in a much more partnership kind of way that, that Frater Acker details. To me, Douglas, in the Solomonic sphere of the European grimoires, we see that when it comes to 
having a goetic quote unquote grimoire. That is not to say, and I remember Jake Stratton Kent uh, was sharing with me, this was years ago, but that people like to say goetic spirits, right. you know, like <laughs> the La Megatons Goetia has 72 goetic spirits, but that's that, but saying goetic is describing the profession of the person. So right. it's kind of weird to be, you know, using that, those terms. Yeah. Just a fascinating thing. I think. I think something else that Jake said, um, and, and I'd like to get your opinion on, on this. I, I believe I can quote him on this. I really hope I don't misquote him on this. But he says that not all Goetia is Solomonic, but all Solomonic magic is Goetia or or Goetic. Yeah, that's that's a that that is a huge huge delightful can of worms that I am yeah. restraining. I'm trying to, I'm trying to open it only halfway, right. <laughs> but you are right. You know, Jake um, was great at pointing out that when you look at grimoires, like the Megatons Goetia with the famous, as you said, the 72 spirits, when you look at the Heptameron, you almost see two different strains. And this is something Aaron Leach has talked about too. And Jake, you almost see two different strains of spiritual en engagement in the Western European grimoire tradition. So you, you might have language in there that seems very harsh, very coercive, almost kind of with this overlay of uh, you know medieval Catholicism. But then you also see language in there that is very much based on building relationships with spirits, welcoming the spirits. Uh, the Key of Solomon talking about you know welcoming spirits royally and, and having incense. And so I think that when Jake is saying that, he's talking about the fact that the original, quote unquote, if you will, strain that he was talking about, about this kind of goetic current that is not Solomonic as part of ancient Greece, this relationship-based calling, encanting, working with the spirits, that, that thread moved into Europe, but it was then mixed with this kind of um, Christian, Catholic, ritualistic formula, this kind of ecclesiastical formalism that was used with an aspergillum and uh, the vestments of a priest. And, and those kind of combined into one system in the Solomonic tradition. So I think that I might be totally off, totally, but I think that might be one of the elements that Jake was, was getting to. For all of my guests, I have this form that I send to them, and and I sometimes ask to like get their opinions. And I said on this one question, it's like we could have a whole episode about this. And Alex wrote back, agreed. So I, I'm I'm trying really hard not to, but I think of for a lot of what Jake was talking about, he he has been quoted as saying, you know, I don't do angels, and by that, what he meant because he he used to have a Patreon before he passed away, sadly. And I wish that it was still up. He reiterated what he meant by that, and he's just like. It's so hard to differentiate between what is an angel and what isn't that there doesn't seem to be like some kind of um, through line through all kinds of experience. What chthonic or underworld or even dead spirits seem to have it seems to be the kind of magic that most Solomonic grimoires are aiming to have contact with, even though there could be grimoires, again, that say that you're dealing with angels, say something like the Heptameron, that they might not actually be angels per se, that kind of thing, but... Yeah, it's it gets dicey, and I think we're not great at categorizing stuff. Right, exactly. I mean, you have the Heptameron is a great example, and I know that you know Adley Nichols and Joseph H. Peterson and and Andy Foster and Mihai Vartajaru and, and and others have done so many so much amazing work. And as, as you mentioned, Joe's book, The uh, Elucidation of Necromancy, is fantastic. But you're right. I mean, in the Heptameron, it says that you know this is the you know angels of the air of you're Sunday. Right. Those are, I mean, Varkon Rex right. in the Heptameron is truly not only a Chthonic entity or, or, or an aerial entity, I, I should say, it's a genic entity because yeah. Varkon is Barkan Melek. Barkan in Arabic means two thunders, you know? So this is a genic being. And so you're right. You, in the European tradition, you see this whitewashing, you see this kind of subtle pivoting, and which of course people could have been prosecuted and killed if they were caught with certain grimoires in certain parts of Europe. I know Joseph H. Peterson is really good about teasing out that that wasn't always the case, no, but no. you're right, Douglas, that there, there is this um, kind of 
blending that happens. And when you look at, uh, and again, not going down that rabbit hole, but absolutely fascinating. When you look at grimoires like the Yanua Magica Reserata and Dr. Thomas Rudd and this kind of crystallomantic angelic work, mm -hmm. there are tests in there. There are interrogations because many times, as you said, Douglas, a, a, and this happened with Dee and Kelly so many times, right? They would call a spirit. They're th they think they're, they're talking to an angel, yeah. but they realize that it is not. Yeah. An angelic beings alone would not show up no. to the circle, to the, the crystal sphere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh man. So much to talk about. It's, it's incredible. And, and we're, we're an hour in here. Uh, let's, let's kind of pivot here. We're going to talk a little bit more about the kind of things that go along with engaging with Solomonic magic and, and more so within a contemporary context. So this is something I get asked so often. I don't know if you get asked this kind of, this kind of stuff as well, Alex, but pretty much all Solomonic magic grimoires, they come from an Abrahamic socio-religious perspective and context. So what do you think about folks attempting to do Solomonic magic, but without any of the Christian content, perhaps using like pagan gods, theurgic words, uh, say Neoplatonic language, uh, Ambilicus on the mysteries kind of stuff as, as like a, a replacement to, you know, having uh, the word God or by the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in there, because I know that kind of stuff rubs people, a lot of people these days wrong and they're wondering hey can i just switch it out you talk, doug you talked last time about how this kind of stuff is somewhat mutable can i just you know throw toth in there as, a, as opposed to saying <laughs> jc um what, what do you think well certainly the number one rule in magic right is if it if it works for you great then, yeah. then keep doing it that is that is excellent uh of course but i would say that using the names in the grimoire you might be surprised because the names themselves have already been uh, kind of switched or borrowed, which we can get into. But I would say the bottom line is using the names in the grimoire, it's important because what you're doing is as a magician, as an operator, you're stepping into an esoteric tributary, a, yeah. effectively a, a signature of ritual that the spirits recognize. And so as we talked about with the Heptameron, Varkhan Rex is really this Arabic jinn king, Barkhan Melek, but the ritual itself in the Heptameron, this, you know, jinnic, but wait, it's an angel of the air, but wait, it's a jinn king. But the ritual itself uses Latin, Greek, and Hebrew names of God to conjure Varkhan, and then other names of the most, you know, high God, for example, uh, to conjure in the Arabic tradition. You see conjurations to Barkhan Malik. And so even in Arabic, it's, it's fascinating seeing in the Arabic script Hebrew names. So like in the Arabic script, it says like Adonai, like spelled out phonetically, which is just fascinating. But in both of those cases, let's take Varkhan Rex for, for an example. If you're using the Heptameron or an Arabic system, in both cases, both might be targeting the same spirit. But it seems to me that each conjuration has its own esoteric momentum and kinetic energy that's built up, which is more effective if you stay within those lines. Now, that being said, this is something I know that's big for you, Douglas, and it's big for me. Solomonic magic is about finding out what works. So definitely don't just blindly follow something because it's written in a book. Every single quote-unquote grimoire traditionalist that I know adapts it. It's idiosyncratic. They make it their own. And so, so you might say, well, shucks, Alex, you know, or Douglas – that sounds contradictory. You know, I mean, what, what do you mean? Like do what's in the book, but make it your own. That's right. ridiculous. You, you, you need to clearly, you know, have more adult Coca-Colas and, and pontificate <laughs> more. Right. But you know what? It is not contradictory. And here's a perfect example. Okay. Spirit feedback. This is a great example. Mm -hmm. I love this example. And it's from a later grimoire that we've already brought up in drawing spirits into crystals from Francis Barrett's The Magus from 1801. Among the questions to ask the spirit, when you successfully, this is in the context of angels, are asking questions including, what is thy office? What is thy true sign or character? When are the times most agreeable to thy nature to hold conference with us? So let's just stop right here. Right here, we see that if you are contacting a spirit of Mars, let's say that you're calling, that spirit, when you call it, when you ask it those questions, the feedback you get, it has its own or potentially can have its own private name that is not found in a grimoire. And if that's the case, then use that. I mean, if if the same spirit of Mars, for example, provides feedback to yourself or your scryer that, you know, well, 
yes, I prefer to be called not on a Tuesday of the day of Mars, but instead I prefer to be called on the fourth hour of Thursday ruled by Jupiter, you know, something like that, or the first hour, the eighth hour of Thursday ruled by Jupiter, then try that, you know? So Solomonic traditionalism to me is about relationships and mutually agreed upon terms almost than anything else. So it seems contradictory on the surface, but it really is based on those relationships. Definitely. I, something that my last guest, actually, I'm going to put it this way. Uh, I like, I like the idea of talking about a tributary. The way that I've always tried to contextualize it for people is to think about these kind of things as existing as ecosystems. Like where does an ecosystem start or stop? But I also understanding that there's certain things within that ecosystem that make it an ecosystem. And I think a lot of times the language that is used um, within these spells themselves is a very important aspect of it. But there's hope for people there because I know – People get really tripped up about using the the word Jehovah or or using the word Jesus Christ. I guess that I had back in um, back in October, Julio Cesar Odi, who I talked about nigromancy with, he said that this kind of magic, specifically nigromancy, and it's, there's a, my, there are minute differences between nigromancy and Solomonic magic, but um, they kind of go hand in hand. He said that this is kind of magic is done by method, not by faith. What what do you think of that kind of a comment, Alex? Yeah, I mean, I think this this Julio Cesar Ode's comment kind of harkens back to something Dr. Stephen Skinner says, which is that these are techniques right. of of magic, and so they can be replicated. I remember once Dr. Skinner mentioned that, you know, I, I think I asked him something along the lines of, "Well, okay, could you be an atheist and practice these techniques?" You know, yeah. and he answered that, "Well." You could be an atheist, meaning you don't hold a belief in some supreme deity, but you wouldn't be a materialist for so long no. because it would it would you would all of a sudden find yourself swimming in this world of 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 spirits. And so I think it kind of goes to that where you're right. There's this technique that's important, and even in grimoires or in operations that claim to be based on faith, uh, for example. In the Ruddian grimoires, right? We have these long prayers. Same thing with John D. We have these long prayers, page after page to angels, yeah. right? Yeah. But yeah. as David Rankin says, that, you know, it seems like it's faith. And faith is an important thing because I think it also helps kind of pivot and guide your consciousness to a state of communing with, and again, exactly, even if you're uncomfortable saying the names, you are communing with a tributary. You're stepping into a tradition that already existed. And so that has its own kinetic efficacy with it. But also by, it seems like it's faith, but as David Rankin says, the repetition itself of Jehovah, of Adonai, Shaddai, el Chai, of the Most High God and, and going, that's part of the technique is, is, is the repetition of the divine name. So it seems on the surface like it might be faith. But at the same time, there is this replicability that I think is important. That being said, the last thing I'll say on, on, on this as well, Douglas, I know it's something you've talked about and Frater Ash and Shassan and others talk about is spirits, broadly speaking, respond very well to sincerity. And so that doesn't necessarily mean like a blind faith, like you're just blinding. But when you are stepping into a circle that you have a very sincere intent you are approaching things with a full heart, with a full spirit, and you're dedicating all of your attention to the ritual at hand. So it is about, I think, finding that balance too. Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Again, we could probably spend another hour here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I just I just get asked asked about it so much. And I understand, I understand why people are are hesitant, particularly. A lot of people are raised in very fundamentalist Christian households. And the magic is what what, what brings them a great deal of comfort and to to have to like oh I really want to get involved with magic and then they pick up these books and it's like man it's just nothing it's just nothing but God it's not like the movies where it's it's I'm talking to to Satan to, to summon a spirit I picked up the book of Oberon and all it does is there's so many huge prayers half of the half of the first part of that book is just prayers to God and it's so um, right it, it's it's interesting stuff but I think you're correct to um, to put a pin in in, in David Rankin's uh, uh, assessment there. Repetition, chanting, repeating words over and over again, it does get you into a very different state of mind as well. And that's a, that's a thing that also needs to be registered, particularly for this form of specific kind of magic. Uh, something else that I get asked so many questions about, because it, it is in uh, a lot of Solomonic grimoires, are, let's just say, 
they weren't at the time, but they are now somewhat more controversial aspects. Um, so these are things like animal sacrifice. These are things like digging up a body. These are things like using a small child, uh, specifically usually a boy, to help with scrying and things of that nature. The people ask me, will the magic still work if we skip or amend certain parts of, of these grimoires? Yeah, it's it's such a fantastic question, and it's something you see in global traditions too. I, I remember chatting with Peter Jenks uh, talking about Thai occult practices, and when when you look at different practices across the world, yes, um, traditionally going back hundreds of years, sacrifice of of animals or um, the use of of blood, blood. Uh, ha- has been called yes, which I know in the Key of Solomon, for example, uh, when it comes to you know bat blood or other things. I do know a few magicians who um, actually do not um, try not to give too much away, but they actually treat the animals very humanely. For example, here's a perfect example. If you are the owner of a black cat and you literally take it in for a routine blood draw, Mm -hmm. well, I'm not saying to do anything, but I'm saying that there are humane ways in which animals are not harmed and it's part of the medical process. So that can be something where, again, it totally depends on, you know, the area that you're in and the culture and what's, what's permissible, what's legal, what's not legal. But I remember this Douglas, that when first reading the grimoires, you're right. People might be, have some, they might have some head scratching, right? Like, wait, I need this or nothing will work or wait, they want me to wait, do what with what ingredient where now? When you look at the Solomonic tradition, one of the beautiful things in the tradition is about change and adaptability with plenty of room to meet you where you're at, because this is the way that it's always been. This isn't like a new 21st century or 20th century reading into the grimoires. So let me just say at the outset that I I think your question is great because it has a lot to do with materia magica and the tools, right? When you think about yeah. the robes, the holy water consecration, you know, fire, there are swords, there are daggers. I I really want to say lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my, but I will not do that. (laughs) You just did. Ah, I just did. I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. You know what? There are so many procedures, but making the tools, right? Gathering the herbs, putting things together, pre-consecrating them, even with materials, which we can get into like the lion skin belt and, and, and other things, there are is adaptability. There, there are ways where it is less about the tools and meeting something exactly right to the letter versus creating something, crafting something, having something that is a sincere representation of a tool that you're using to engage with a spirit. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a really important point. Um, and we can definitely go through some examples there too. If we're going to hang on something like the idea of a lion skin belt, there are magicians, people that you've even talked to on your your show who do have lion skin belts. They talk about that, man, in in the grimoires, there's so, here's the thing, there's so many grimoires. And again, the the interchangeability of the techniques, and although some of the techniques are very same, same, the specific what of the tools themselves change. So you have lion skin belt here. In other grimoires, you have buckskin. It's buckskin that that gets used. Oh, sorry. It's it's heart skin. A dry thong should be that of a lion or of heart skin. A personal example for my uh, my goetic dabblings, and by goetic I mean actually using the Ars Goetia. I use a, a snakeskin belt. That was some reason that was, and that was a very. It's all tied in. If So if you know how certain things are used, particularly looking at something like Stephen Skinner talking about the Solomonic Circle within the Ars Goetia being a Ouroboros or a snake that swallows its own tail, a belt is kind of like that. And a lot, I know Grimoire purists would probably be like, ah, Doug, what the hell are you doing? You're telling people to, hey, everybody, just grab a snakeskin belt. It'll work just as well. It might not for you. What I'm trying to say about all of this kind of thing is that there's an operation you want from a certain grimoire. Guess what? Chances are there's another grimoire that you tell you something completely different to get the same kind of effects as well. And it, what's unfortunate is that it's about knowing a lot about what is in what grimoire. Luckily, we are living in the days of information exchange. And uh, David Rankin also just released the Grimoire Encyclopedia, which is just the most mind blowing document I wish I had. 15 years ago, um, in which you can see certain tools and where they are and where, and where certain things exist. 
I'm just going to say this. This Grimoire Encyclopedia that was just released by David Rankin through Hadean Press is an astonishing document that'll allow you to be able to, if, if you know how to do certain kinds of cross-referencing and taking good notes, and you want to get involved in this kind of magic, Solomonic magic, the Grimoire Encyclopedia is a must-have. It is a tool unlike any other. And magicians back in the day would have killed to have something like the Grimoire Encyclopedia. Yes. There's so much stuff within these, these grimoires that they just don't really translate to nowadays as far as um, what, what is acceptable. And to each person needs to approach these uh, with on their own terms as to, to what they – so, yeah, it's, it's as Alex says – it's not make or break, I don't think. It's this kind of stuff, it's not particularly about the what. It is about the how. And that is the how within Solomonic Magic is the most important part. Absolutely. And and just to be clear as well, you know, when when Douglas and I are talking about, you know, buckskin or blood and all of these things, they can be a little, you know, either off-putting. Obviously, make sure, you know, never to break the law. Yes. Always follow your local laws and regulations. Always be above board. But in addition to that, you're, you're right, Douglas, that different grimoires have different prescriptions for the operation, which lends itself to exactly an emphasis on the how. But even when you look at within the grimoires themselves, there's flexibility within the grimoire. I'll g I have a few examples here. Sure, do it. Place, for example, right? Yeah. Like, okay, location is probably the most important thing yeah. when, when, when you think about, you know, you don't want to do a uh, goetic evocation in the middle of a you know, downtown New York City in Times Square or something. I mean, I suppose you could, but I'm not sure what you, what results you might get. But in the Key of Solomon, it says caves, caverns, grottos, gardens, orchards. These are great, but quote, best of all are crossroads and where four roads meet during the depth and silence of night. And listeners are saying, I'm not near a crossroads. The key says, quote, but if thou canest not go conveniently unto any of the, these places, then thy house and even thine own chamber, or indeed any place, provided it hath been purified and consecrated with the necessary ceremonies, will be found fit and convenient for the convocation and assembling of spirits. So we have flexibility within the grimoire. In the heptameron, the robe, the vestment, it says, quote, let it be a priest's garment if it can be, but if it cannot be had, if you're unable to obtain a Roman Catholic priest's garment, let it be of linen and clean. Again, flexibility. In the heptameron, you should say the name of the hour and the name of the angel of the hour, you know, showing the sigil of the angel in your hand engraved in the appropriate metal or written on virgin parchment or kid skin, skin of a young goat. So again, we have more flexibility. As far as the lion skin belt, Douglas, a great example, of course, uh, th that your, people say, oh my gosh, that, that's horrible. And all lions should be protected. All life should be protected. An example I remember, I think I saw it on a forum years back, but I know magicians who, if, if they, for instance, if they find a part of a 100-year-old lion pelt, so yeah. the lion, unfortunately, had already been you know, yeah. killed many years ago, but they can still fulfill the requirement and it allows for flexibility. And as you touched on, Douglas, so elegantly, there's you can use heart skin, you can use buck skin, there, there's so much, you can use paper, you can use parchment. So to me, when you look in the grimoires, the Solomon, the actual Solomonic tradition is malleability, it's change, it's idiosyncratic growth, and it's it's this kind of esoteric dynamism that is found in the tradition itself, as opposed to like a 21st century reading that we kind of have to do to feel better. I, I think you find that malleability within the system itself, which which you so eloquently uh, articulated as well. It is one of those things where I would I would urge people if this kind of stuff is fascinating to you, it's not that you're breaking the rules. It's just that it, it's good to understand the, the Solomonic method. It's good to right. understand what is possible. It, it is really helpful if you just jump in there and just be like, I'm just going to switch this out, switch this out, switch this out. I don't know how well that will go for you. Right. But further reading and, and, and creativity, that's the other thing, is that I think creativity gets rewarded within Solomonic magic. Love it. 
this kind of stuff is interesting to you, please go through all of the show notes in, in this and everything. I love how Alex just brings the fire. You, all the examples, man. It's great. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's so good. I, I just write these questions and I'm like, oh man, I hope that I can remember certain things in my brain. <laughs> Thank goodness you, you brought up the gnomes. All I would try to say is that creativity is always rewarded. Understand the rules understand how you can bend them and understand what can be used as replacements is really cool. And and even something like Animal Sacrifice, I had Sam Block on the show. Uh, he's just like, instead of drowning a bird, you just paper mache. Um, if, if you come from an animistic point of view, everything's alive in some way. And and that might sound like a trite statement, but, it, it, but it's very true. Make a paper mache or knit a figurine of an animal, the one that needs to be sacrificed, and then imbue it with some form of life through ritual and then go through the sacrifice of that life that you have created be creative innovate exactly exactly i want to talk a little bit about the idea of location as well a little bit more because uh, this is the kind of thing where i tend to go back and forth part of me is always always like you can do it anywhere but i will put this asterisk there's that my best results have always been outside of a city near water, nature adjacent, kind of like what the grimoires specifically say. So um, I think Stephen Skinner talks a lot of times about how cities aren't the best place for Solomonic magic. I want to hear your thoughts about this kind of stuff because part of me is always like, yeah, you can do it anywhere. But also I have to be honest with myself and honest with what I'm sharing is that my best results have always been where I'm alone. I'm at I'm at a place where there's nobody near me and uh, I have the time and the space to get all of the things I need set up, set up. Then things will work out really well. Not a lot of people can have those kind of circumstances when they want to and uh, it's unfortunate. But what, what do you think of the idea of location for this kind of magic? Oh, definitely. I, I think being um, isolated and quiet as you can be, as you said, Douglas, is so important. I, yeah. I had the opportunity to work with some magical colleagues uh, here in the American Midwest um, over the last few years, very deep in nature. And it really does make a difference because David Rankin and Stephen Skinner, again, both of them say, I believe this is in the um, second uh, of their volumes of the Source Works of Ceremonial Magic, but saying that, you know, if you think about, and this is not comparing demonic spirits to animals at all, but if you think about, I want to see a bear. Well, okay. Bears are very rare and you have to go deep into their habitat and they're not as common now as they were, say, you know, 100, 200 years ago. And so just like today, that is a very similar approach where you have to go to create the most hospitable environment that you can. And it might be in nature. To me, I find nature, as you said, Douglas, so eloquently being, you know, isolated, you know, having low noise pollution levels, that's so important, but it could be something in a more urban environment. Uh, I believe, I cannot remember the specific um, magician. I believe perhaps Dr. Skinner mentioned this, but uh, for instance, an important thing is to be connected to the ground or on concrete because concrete on top of ground is, is a very important thing. Well, if there's an empty uh, parking garage, for example, you know, and it's, it's concrete and you lay down your nine foot, uh, you know, Solomonic tarp there, or I should say an abandoned parking garage because you never want to interfere right. <laughs> with actual traffic, but an abandoned building, uh, which you should always do not to interfere with anything can be really important. And so you're right in a crowded city that would not necessarily, from my experience, it would not necessarily be the best place, but anywhere, even in an urban environment, if you can reduce noise pollution and even late at night, you have a significant amount of noise pollution reduction usually. And so I think that's also things to keep in mind uh, as well. Yeah. It, it It's odd. I wish I could do Solomonic evocation just kind of like in my, in my apartment. I've tried and I have tried, truly tried. And it's been not good, not the best results, kind of pseudo results and things that maybe I could be like, well, maybe something happened, but it's night and day between when I had a period of time to spend a few days by myself. And it's just like, oh, okay. That's what everybody was talking about. I see. And there's a reason that 
they keep saying in grimoires over and over again, do this there, do this here, buy a water, on a crossroads, do this and this. is like, okay, so there is a lineage and a reason that they're saying these kind of things. They're not just saying it because somebody wrote it once upon a time and they just kept picking up. A lot of times these, which did happen, I'm not going to beat around the bush, a lot of these a lot of these things, these grimoires existed as novelties. Like that's something that we, as as magicians, unfortunately, a lot of these things, particularly blue grimoires, they kind of were um, fun little novelty items. But um, other grimoires, a lot of times they were actually written by practicing magicians and not just copyists wanting to have something to talk about uh, while you had people over for dinner. Exactly. Anyhow, I went on a bit of a weird tangent. That I, apologies, everybody. No, I love it. <laughs> um, so one of the things I'm always impressed with, Alex, is when you dip into the Latin, my dude, the language ah. within Solomonic grimoires. Does one need to speak Latin? What is for you the best practice in these regards? Because I, I can't speak a lick of Latin. I sound like I don't know the the centurion when when uh, when Michael 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 Palin is talking to uh, talking to those centurions and trying to get them la- to laugh and in Life of Brian just <laughs> I, my Latin is my Latin is terrible but your Latin whenever I hear it whenever you drop your Latin on on Glitch Bottle, I'm like oh my goodness I might have to do that <laughs> well, well you you always sound more eloquent than I do so I I think knowing for for me in the Latin it's it only gets you so far but um, <laughs> uh, you know what. Language is such a great question, Douglas. And I mean, yes, I I personally um, have memorized and used the rites in ecclesiastical Latin or church Latin, as it's as it's called, mm-hmm. which is very similar to like modern Italian and kind of how mm-hmm. how pronunciation is as opposed to classical Latin. And so, to which I say to all the classical Latin speakers, you know, which sounds cooler? Okay, when 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 you have when you want to say I came, I saw, and I conquered, is it veni vidi vici or is it veni weedy wiki? I mean, come on, like that is the classical pronunciation. And that's fine if you practice, that's great. Classical, sure. Ovid's metamorphosis, awesome. However, <laughs> I which I have a ton of respect for and Virgil, of course. <laughs> but in terms of the the audibleness of it, how it sounds. Mm-hmm. Um, but to directly answer your question, uh, so I personally use Latin, and you know, okay. Dr. Richard Kickheffer, who I would consider one of the great sources of mm. Solomonic magic, and and he mentions that uh, in his book, 1997 book, Forbidden Rites, which is just a lovely book um, that is a an excellent examination of a uh, 1450s a German. Um, handbook of necromancy. He mentions that in the Middle Ages, spirits reportedly responded better to Latin because of its ties with the church. So Dr. Kickheffer says in Forbidden Rites, much better than I can say, quote, on one level, one might say that the choice of language is a matter of indifference. The demons or other spirits being conjured know all human tongues, and they can be addressed effectively in any of them. Yet, in a different way, the selection of language was important because It was only formulas in Latin that were clearly related to the prayers of mainstream liturgy. Necromancers who had command of Latin and could use it to demonstrate the groundedness of their rites and the liturgical tradition of the church could no doubt gain readier acceptance as authentic masters of their art. And even if demons could understand other languages, they seemed, like God, to pay special attention when addressed in Latin, unquote. And so I think Latin carries this kind of, again, speaking of historical tributaries, this, this, potency. And uh, however, all of that being said, Douglas, a very important point for all the listeners out there is for most magicians who I've spoken with, um, on the record and off the record, use English, for example, which is great because this this goes to the really key point that I know you're very keen to bring up, as am I, which is whatever language you're using, if it works and it works for you, keep doing it. And so yeah. One of the keys to the last thing I'll say on this is um, the language. So whether something's in you know Italian or French or Latin or Arabic or whatever it is, one of the keys is regardless of what the language is. One of the things I might ask is, are you pronouncing the nomina magica, the divine names, as well as you can? Yeah. I think that you know, which is like what maybe five percent of what an actual conjuration yeah. is. So it's like if you're pronouncing those as well as you can. The rest of the language, I think, has an enormous amount of flexibility. So if it works for you, keep doing it. Bingo. Yeah, I think that that is right on the money there with the best advice. The important names, try to nail those. 
I have theories as to why I think English works. A lot of it has to, I like what Richard says, and that's a, that's a dope quote you just brought up there. I think we're living in very secular, mm-hmm. irreligious times right now. And that is the ecosystem into which a lot of these spirits are trying to, to break through. So I've got my theories as to why English works. I like what Lon Miley Duquette said once is that when we're doing this kind of stuff, it's like an American tourist going to Paris and trying to order something off the menu, trying to speak French initially. Now, they'll order something on the menu, they'll really try to speak French, but guess what? That waiter already knows English. So he'll smile when you try to speak French to him, and like, yes, yes, okay, very good. But then he's going to respond to you in English because he's got things to do, and he's got, he's got orders to run. It's easiest, it's a heuristic if he just, if he just responds to you in English. He, he's like, thank you for trying to speak my language, but I would appreciate you speaking in the language that you know that I know as well. So I think that there's an aspect of that as far as this kind of thing is concerned. Uh, I have had zero problems with using English, but yeah, I'm, I'm, you are correct. When you try to get those names, the spiritual names, uh, as well as the nomina magica and pronounced properly, that is important. I'm, I'm just going to hang with you here. Do, Alex, do you memorize everything when you're going through a Solomonic evocation, or do you bring a book into the circle with you? You know, I personally, um, what I bring into the circle is my petition uh, and, and the mm. specific request that I have, but everything else is memorized. So I, oh, wow. I, I go in there. Yikes. But I, but I, I have that because I'm actually lazy, um, which sounds contradictory, <laughs> but it's because I don't, as Dr. Skinner says, right, in the Goetia of Dr. Yeah. I don't want to fumble with mm-hmm. uh, a manuscript in the dim candlelight, right? So I, yeah. I, I just approach it, but that's just because I'm a weird nerd and I just enjoy kind of um, doing that. And when I'm you know, stuck in traffic and someone looks over into my vehicle and I'm talking to myself, reciting grimoires, um, you know, right. that, that's always a risk that, that one must have right. in, in practicing. Um, but, but, but yes, I, I do enjoy um, memorizing. I think memorization, whether it's your favorite poetry, whether it's literature, whether it's a grimoire, it's just such a lovely, because I think when you possess something by memory, Mm. the grimoire in a way or the poem possesses you. And I, and I think Mm. there's just this lovely exchange there. Um, but to your point, I totally agree with you. I mean, most of the, I mean, Dr. Stephen Skinner, David Rankin, I would assume, Frater Ashen and Chasson, Aaron Leach, we can go on and on. Jake Stratton Kent, I would assume. Um, exactly. English, for example, fantastic, right? uh, Amazing results and, and excellent. And so I, I love your point too about if it works for you, please keep doing it because, because that's the most important thing. For sure. Yeah. I, uh, I, it's weird because I, I do hear, and a lot of people have, whose opinions on Solomonic magic are very important to me about memorizing and memorizing, but uh, there's also evidence within the grimoires. They say a few good books to call by. Mm-hmm. You know, Benito uh, Cellini basically saying like they bring grimoires into the circle and they're reading, they're going through it. So it's, I would love to be, and I'm good at memorizing. I just, I, I like having a grimoire <laughs> with me when I'm doing things. It's weird. I, I, I think it's also part of that how it's done. I like the holding of a, a leather-bound book that is of, of my own writing. I'm, and as you know, like uh, I'm really big in this whole idea of the the Libra Spiritum, the personalized Libra Spiritum. And I think that there's um, there is some kind of thing that occurs when you bring the written words. So the words from the grimoire, it's not just the grimoire, it's your, I'm copying the words in my own hand for my own book and bringing that in. Yes. Yes. I love that. And I should, I should clarify. I do the exact same thing. I have a Libra Spiritum where I, before memorizing anything, you must copy it uh, from front to Mm -hmm, back mm -hmm. in your own hand with ink that you've consecrated. I also do that. And there is something about this kind of potency of holding a book as well. And so I think where, where memorizing comes in is when the candlelight is dim and when you are pressured to rush something, having something memorized allows you to actually slow down a little bit and, and really take pacing at, at a really a, a pace that works for you without having to worry about turning the page at the right time. But Douglas, to your point, there, there's another important thing that you just touched on, which I, I love, which is when you look at grimoires, yes, there's the formal conjurations. But many of the grimoires also leave room outside Mm -hmm. of the conjurations for this kind of green verdancy of language, as Dr. Alexander Cummins says, this kind of extemporaneous speaking. So, for example, 
in the Elucidarium Necromanciae, right? In the Elucidation of Necromancy Manuscript, VRL 1115, uh, which is in the Vatican Library. It says that right before you start calling the spirits, right before the exact same section that we see in the famous Heptameron, it has this extemporaneous element to it. It says, mm. with a courageous heart, stand in the center of the circle and call the spirits whose names are written in the outer band. And so this, and I, I've spoken with magicians about this, you have a wonderful example here of calling from the heart, extemporaneous, something that isn't even in a grimoire. And so right. what do you bring to that? What poetics, what what specific syntactical idiosyncrasies? How how do you, because if, if you and I, Douglas, were to memorize the same thing, the same heptameron, let's say, yeah, your yeah. You know, Douglas Bachelor neuronic connections, the, the neural synaptical organization, the patterns, the way you enunciate words, the way things come out will be totally different from my own pacing, right? So even with memorizing, you make it yours, but there's also this extemporaneous joy in, in calling from the heart. So I think it's it's kind of getting a mix of both too. Yeah. I want to stick with this a, a little bit because sure. this ties into <laughs> yet another can of worms that we call, I'm going to put those uh, those bunny ear, uh, huge air quotes thing, <laughs> ceremonial <laughs> magic. So I have to ask you, why was this term ceremonial? You'll hear these hot takes on Twitter, like Ceremo the term ceremonial magic didn't exist before the 19th century. Unfortunately, th that's not true. Sorry, guys, that's not true. Ceremonial <laughs> magic, right. was, they were act the words ceremonial magic were put together way, way before the 19th century. Um, but why was this term synonymous with, with the word Goetia in, in the Renaissance? Yeah, that what a what a great question, Douglas. Um, and so you're right. I mean, this stuff goes back such a long time with organized ritualistic magic. And so performance magic, that is absolutely, as you just said, it's part of the technique uh, mm -hmm. because by organizing things in a ritualistic structure, especially with spirits, um, as David Rankin and Dr. Skinner and others have said, that you haven't made contact with the first time. Like you need this structured, and if you would like to follow the Solomonic system, this structured organizational system of approaching spiritual engagement. So Performance magic is part of the technique, but any ritual, any ceremony in magic, no matter what the tradition is, it's performative. Uh, I, I always think of what Frater Ashen Chassan says, which is you're not stepping into a circle as a chattering, isolated human making small mouth noises to satisfy some therapeutic performance need, right? Instead, you're stepping into the current, when you step into a circle, you're stepping into the currents of esoteric tradition that spirits respond to. I mean, there's a reason why specific names, specific nomina magica are used again and again. But as Jake Stratton Kent said in his lovely Geosophia, he mentions that there was, as you said, this much older goetic tradition that did not have this kind of harsh language, it was more based on engagement and relationships. So rituals involving Goetia, as, as, as we were talking about, were different in the Middle Ages than they were in, say, 300 AD, or when you know St. Augustine's writing City of God and mentions Goetia, and he's condemning it, of course, being a Christian saint, but he's writing about a different form than what we see in the Middle Ages. And those rituals were different from what we might find in the Greco-Egyptian magical papyri, where not only in, in those, you know, it's wild, not only are you threatening spirits in some of the rituals you're threatening gods as well you're threatening gods yeah <laughs> yeah so so clearly this like when like people say oh the grimoires are so harsh and i want to go back to this earlier tradition this hectoring of gods <laughs> is not an invention of catholic monks in the middle ages okay this goes way back yeah before. it's egyptian you look at egyptian scrolls we have it consistently this is these are scrolls that are four thousand years old where they're literally yes. threatening the gods saying that y you won't be able to carry the weight of the sun to rise the next morning. <laughs> like imagine the audacity. And these are, these are, I mean, of course they're probably rich enough to have scribes, maybe merchants who have a little bit more money than just the, the regular, but, but to, to be middle upper middle class in Egypt and threatening gods, that is a pretty hefty thing to be doing. This is something that I've been trying to get my my Patreon supporters to really latch onto, and I'm I'm, I'm going to uh, run up the flagpole and see if you uh, salute it, Alex. But I'm trying to get people to think about this kind of stuff, not so much as ceremonial magic, because it, it has a lot of connotations to it. And I think that people get again with this idea of the whatness of this kind of stuff, as opposed to the howness. I think when Stephen talks about 
the the using of paper crowns and spirits responding to things like this that leads me to believe that there is this element of performance that gets responded to more so than just doing the things as a ceremony i think it is in the going through of this process as if it was a performance and i'm not saying that because we in the West have a really hard time differentiating between what is real and what is pretend. That other cultures have zero problems comprehending the false binary of real and not real as opposed to more of a spectrum that these kind of experiences exist on. So my solve in attempting to get people to think about this is concentrate on performance and the performing of the things in the grimoire. The, the consecration is part of the performance. The entire process is part of a performance, and that is probably where you will see your results best, not as like, I did the thing, I ticked all the boxes, nothing happened. What do you think of this pivot towards calling it performative magic as opposed to ceremonial magic? I mean, I truly, uh, as usual, I cannot say it better than you did. I, I, I totally agree. I think that um, the performative aspect is an, what you're doing is you are effectively raising this this architecture of organization around as as you say Douglas the how of the ritual and you're adding a formality to it a performative aspect that is exactly it is it is necessary because you're able to guide not only yourself as the operator but the spirits who are kind of swimming if you think of each grimoire as like a river they're kind of swimming through this already laid down esoteric current and so mm-hmm. i think that's a great a really like you nailed it an example i think dr skinner brings up but it might be david rankin is you know for instance if you are in court for whatever reason uh maybe you know you got one too many speeding tickets maybe i'm not speaking from personal experience at all um but (laughs) if 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 someone's handing you a piece of paper that is an official court document and it's written in crayon (laughs) <laughs> that 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 is not going to maybe carry the weight yeah. that that it is but if it's if it's written meaning if it's prepared in a way that 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 is the how of it which is mm. it's 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 prepared in a way that communicates this is an official document that carries a much different weight so to your example about the paper crown i think it's a lovely example um which is that yes it's not that like you you have to have a lion skin belt and a crown of solid gold with these 28 gems specifically aligned to the 28 mansions of the moon or else right. everything falls into disrepair it's it's again that paper example it's like but the crown represents the how as you say yeah. and i love that because you're right crown sword circle the, these kind of beautiful elemental things that you when you start to break down solomonic rituals from no matter what grimoire you pick, when you look at the techniques, you're right. It breaks down into the how. And so I love the way that you phrase that because I think it, it really hits on liberating. It, I, I know with myself when I first started, like it, it liberates you from mm-hmm. this, as William Blake sends you know, the, in his poem, London, these mind forged manacles that are yes. constantly around you. Like I don't have this specific thing. Therefore I will never do magic. And so no. that clearly <laughs> is the opposite, right? And yeah. look at the, look at the cunning man grimoires, yes. right? Those are full of I different love variations. Yes. I love them. I love them. I'm always telling people like, take your cues from the cunning folk. It's there's just, there's such a font of inspiration to me to like, it's right. It's so great. And, and truly, it's it this might sound controversial but uh, i think one of the best things for people trying to get into solomonic magic is is actually read all of jim baker's the cutting man's handbook because what you were seeing are just like little snippets of these austere grimoires that we talk about as solomonic magic but through the lens of, of this this group of people called the cunning folk or, or cunning man that they were certainly influenced by grimoires the some of the more literate ones certainly and some of them were definitely taking aspects of the grimoires and adapting them to suit their purposes but they had their own kind of like weird twists to them the examples that he brings up in that book are really quite excellent yes absolutely it's hugely inspiring to just look at how the cunning folk did this and how they would look at things like Solomonic grimoires is to look at the people who almost have very little and how they adapted to use them um, historically because these people really existed. We're not talking about there's 
I keep going on these tangents, everybody, and I'm very I sorry, no. but I but I but I'm really I, I really love this stuff and I truly love this. We have this idea that it was only practiced by rich people. It was only rich people who could read and write and do this kind of stuff. And as we go further and further in time forward, we're discovering through things like the secrets of Solomon and whatnot, is that no, a lot of other people were doing this kind of stuff. People who had very little. A lot of times, yes, they were literate, but a lot of times they had no money. They were just given her because they wanted to. And you have to take that into account. You do not need, as Alex said, this crown of jewels. Do not let that shackle you from doing this kind of magic. It's not easy to do. It's just it is possible to do if you're cunning, if you know the rules. You don't <laughs> have to break things. Um, anyway, ah, I've, I've gone on for, for too long here. I have, to, I have to ask you, though, Alex – in what vein do you find Solomonic magic works best for you? Do you think sticking as close to the book as possible? We talked about this a bit last episode, but I'm asking you because I know you've engaged in this magic and you talk so wonderfully about this magic. And I want to ask, what works best for you, Alex, specifically? Do you do you like to go from the book as, as close as possible? Do you find that you'll read the book and they say, like, maybe I might be able to substitute this or change this? I want to know, what's, what's, what's the Alexander Eth approach to Solomonic magic? Ah, well, that is, uh, gosh, it, it, it certainly is an approach that I would say is, first and foremost, definitely open to malleability and looking at different ways that you can um, combine techniques. So for example, I think as David Rankin and Dr. Skinner and so many other people say, I think it is, if you are working with a grimoire, I think it is really important to, at first, try it, especially because you're starting out at it, you know, try and go through the grimoire as close as you can, not because of some dogmatic, you know, fidelity that you're trying to show to the tradition. And it turns into this like petrified, like, oh, I, I have to do this. But because to, to get a sense of the kinetics of the esoteric flow of the ritual. Right. And then once you do that, and ideally after you have successful contact with one of the spirits, as David Rankin says uh, in his, as, as you referenced, Douglas, the wonderful um, uh, Grimoire Encyclopedia. So good. Uh, which is <laughs> so good. <laughs> which is so good, right? It's I mean, so it's, good. I truly, it's a, it's a, a testament to yeah. excellent scholarship. Yeah. You know, and he mentions in there that, I believe it's in the chapter on evocation. So I think it's the second chapter, but he mm. mentions that, you know, when it comes to a ritual, when it comes to do I, add this? Do I subtract this? David Rankin says that adding things, you know, basically is can't hurt might help. In other words, like when you, when you feel, feel free to experiment. And if you say, gosh, you know, I think this technique from another grimoire at this stage in the ritual could be efficacious. Yeah. Add it, see what happens. Yeah. Maybe it's an, it's an extemporaneous part of the ritual and there's a, a, poem that comes to mind as Dr. Alexander Cummins talks about like engaging the kind of syntactical centers where you are reciting things extemporaneously. Try that. So I think it is about a balance, but here's also a really important thing because we were talking earlier about the tools and people look at the tools and they're like, wait a second, I have to make my own holy water in the key of Solomon. I have to gather nine herbs on the day and hour of Mercury and string them together with thread spun by a virgin. And then I have to, you know, cut off an almond branch on the day and hour of Mercury with one stroke at sunrise. And then I have to, you know, do this. And then I have to find, you know, pure linen. And I have to, I have to Libra Spiritum. You know, you and I both use Libra Spiritums. I have to write, you know, every single thing with, with ink that I've consecrated in a quill. But one of the interesting things is that, you know, cause people say, right. Solomonic magic is so complicated. Well, I, I would just bring up two points on this. Solomonic magic is involved, but so is becoming a tarot card reader or a geomancer or an astrologer. A hundred percent. And so, right. So like being willing to put in the effort takes many forms. And so Solomonic magic is involved in the way I approach it with the tools and preparations. Yes. Memorizing things, yes, as you so eloquently said, Douglas, you know, we both use Libra Spiritums. Yes, absolutely. But one of the great things is that for a magician in Solomonic magic, the tools themselves, making them, consecrating them, that is actually part of the journey of stepping in, soaking yourself in these ritualistic currents over 
hundreds or even thousands of years. And there's amazing flexibility, which is just such a beautiful thing. So one of the quotes, I think it's Aaron Leach, um, is, and I love this, we were talking about the clavicula salamanus and the lamegaton, right? The greater yeah. key and the lesser key. One of the great quotes that I love, I, I, I just love this so much, is that we always talk about the keys of Solomon. The lesser key, the lamegaton, the greater key, the clavicula. But they're called keys for a reason, because all they do is open the door. It is you who has to step in with your own feedback and your own relationships with the spirits. You step into the room that the keys unlock and you find this palatial mansion of just engagement with spirits. And so I think that the keys, the grimoires, yes, they're important, just like opening, using a key to open a door is important, but finding that beautiful balance between showing fidelity to a tradition, but being flexible and malleable and doing things that work for you based on your experience and your feedback. Not with it, not what, as you said, not because an author or a grimoire says this, but it's based on feedback that you get. That is the nature of relationships with these spirits. And I think it's all summed up too in the license to depart, right? Where it right. says that may there be peace between me and thee and, and may you go back to your lo you know locale and may you be ready to come again more readily, more easily when you are called again. So it's based on relationships. So that's how I tend to approach it when it comes to working a Solomonic grimoire. Love it. And one other thing I'm just going to tag on there because it's here in my mind. I just have to say it. Solomonic magic. This is the Western magical tradition. Like I, I, I hate to say it. Like, other people might argue if you take Solomonic magic and you sift out the different parts of the process and the tools and the consecrations and every detail of what makes Solomonic magic, those distinct elements are in basically almost every other form of Western magic. Full stop. This is it. If you take apart and understand or even take part in the process of doing Solomonic magic, you are basically in good stead to do almost any other form of ritual magic consecrations, to prayers, to evocation, to astrology, because guess what? We, I, we, we're not going to have time to touch on the astrology this episode, but maybe sometime in the future. It's all tied in with this kind of magic. I have to ask you, Alex, what to try first? What's the first, what should be baby's first Solomonic magic? Where would one go to begin this sort of process? What would you recommend? Oh gosh, uh, what a great question. I would say in terms of kind of classical grimoires that one might think of and grimoires that you can check out. You can, you know, purchase your own copies or go on esotericarchives.com to check out a, a version online. I would say the two that come to mind when it comes to kind of, you know, embracing or different traditions and exploring traditions that don't demand too much on the materials and everything else would be two. I, I think the first one would be the Arbatel, which I know we've mm -hmm. discussed before, you know, the, which is from the 1570s. Um, and it is just a lovely, a lovely grimoire. The beneficial aphorisms that they have are just absolutely gorgeous, like very positive, um, advice for magicians, the Olympic spirits, mm -hmm. um, are so excellent because they are among many different practitioners today, but also in the tradition have an affinity or are said to have an affinity for being very easy to work with yeah. the material. The materia magica is not too involved. You know, there's a conjuration, there's a few different materials, but I, I'd say the Arbitel. I would also say that um, when you look at the work uh, Frater Ash and Chassan has done with drawing spirits into crystals. Uh, he wrote a book called Gateways Through Stone and Circle, where he literally walks through. I think he he was one of the first people to really lower the bar in the best yeah, way possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, and so like going through. Here's how you. Here's how I do the circle, and here's how I get Ebony to make a wand and all of that. And I think that's really good. Also, Rufus Opus wrote a book, uh, The Seven Spheres, which is a variation on the Tritemius drawing spirits into crystals. Much more, as as you say, much more accessible equipment, uh, a crystal sphere. But again, adapting to things, being in the modern world. So I think both of those are really good too. Yeah. But what would you say? I mean, what what Man, what comes I'm, to mind for you? I'm gonna be I'm gonna be a little bit controversial here because it is a bit involved. But I, as I say, no pressure, sure. no, no pressure, no diamonds. I say people leap into the Higromantia. The Higromantia is so cool because you are interacting with a grimoire that, at its roots, 
is seemingly Egyptian, specifically Alexandrian, conjuring an evocation and a myriad of other interesting kinds of magical hijinks seen through and utilized by Byzantine Greek magicians. I think there's a sort of special and amazing and magically palpable power that comes with interacting with a kind of magic that is new and innovative and groundbreaking, of which the Higromantia truly was. And you can see why this sort of magic would catch on like wildfire in, in Europe specifically. That being said, what is not to recommend the Higromantia is if you buy the book, there's a whole bunch of different documents in there. And so you might be a little bit confused because it's not in sequence from cover to cover. Stick with it. Some of these documents are uh, easier to work with than others. And there really truly is a lot in these documents. There's so much fun to be had. But um, I really think the Higromantia is good in the aspect that it has. It's so specific with its timings. Um, to be able to to parse that through and be able to figure out how to do certain things at certain times, I think is really good. But also, it's not as involved as the Kia Solomon as far as uh, as far as like its consecrations. It might seem like that if you've never done this kind of magic, but but truly, it's it's actually pretty easy. A lot of the operations as far as like what you need, but it's also interesting in that it doesn't do that thing where. Like the Ars Goetia, it's like you summon just one demon. It's it's literally holding a gathering. A gathering is coming. And uh, it, if you do it well and you kind of figure out the steps and, and you get the timings right, I really think that if you throw yourself into the deep end by doing the Higromantia or just some of the things from the Higromantia and just literally going through it for about a year and a half like I did, the rewards are quite good as far as setting you up to be able to do the rest of the stuff. And by stuff, I just mean other Solomonic grimoires. But I think that the Higromantia, because of its specificity, as well as uh, more of its reliance on astrology, particularly lunar astrology, there's a bit of astrology in there that is missing in the claviculas. It has a certain protocol to it that is really cool that also lends itself well to uh, prayers with it for every day of the week. Um, so you have that aspect as well. I just think that the the Higromantia is it's, it's complex at first appearances, but once you actually start to engage with it, it becomes much easier and it's not as uh, as crazy with with things that you need to do as as the later European grimoires. Yeah, that's such a beautiful, such a beautiful way to phrase it. And what a what a great grimoire to start with. And I I couldn't help but thinking that, yeah, I mean, I I recommend definitely um, you know, things like the Arbitel and drawing spirits into crystals. Um, but I personally started working with the heptameron and yeah. memorizing the entire thing. So it really just depends on exactly like what I love that. No pressure, no, no diamond. Yeah. Um and but it, and it's it's almost like if you no matter what grimoire you pick, mm -hmm. Arbitel, Higromantia, you know, the Heptameron, you're right that it's it's going to demand mm -hmm. your your full attention and your full sincerity, I think. Wouldn't you wouldn't you say that too? Yeah, definitely. The this is not the kind of stuff where it's like you pick up a book and it's a spell a day kind of stuff. I'd like I, I, and I'm not trying to say that to to shit on people who enjoy those kind of books or even write those kind of books. A lot of these documents would have been workbooks. You can see them, particularly within the the, the actual document and scans of the Heptameron. They're, they've got notes in the margins. Like they're, the, yeah. the, these, are, these were workbooks for the most part. And we're so lucky to actually have them. So these things were worked. Yes, I spent a year and a half doing almost exclusively stuff from the Higromantia. Not everything. Not definitely not every, not with the assistant. What's interesting about the Higromantia is going to be that there's a lot of young boys in this thing. And it's true. There are, but you know, I'd like, uh, wow, I know how that sounds. It sounds way worse than the way that I phrased it. But you truly do not need a young assistant for a lot of the stuff in the Higromantia. There's other operations in there that are that are very crucial to do. And, and I think that the specific, the specific timings is something that's really, really crucial for this kind of magic. But I will also say I did an episode called How to Read Grimoires. The very first grimoire that I said people should start with is the Heptameron. The Heptameron as well is, I think, a pretty great place to start also. Although I find, and this might be, um, this might just be hot take, Doug. 
as interesting as blue grimoires are, and this is a specific kind of French grimoire that that's a, like a genre of grimoire, besides true black magic, which is a, a kind of key of Solomon, or just kind of like a, a really low key key of Solomon, I find that they're not great. <laughs> I know Jake, <laughs> Jake loves the Grimorum Verum, and I would never, I know a lot of people that really like the Grimorum Verum, and Jake has done such a wonderful job of getting people to, to put eyes on the Grimorum Verum. I don't know if it's the best place for folks to start. Um, but uh, they, they, the blue Grimoires are something that are very interesting, and I, I, I would think that uh, as, as simple as they look, Particularly things like um, the Red Dragon or the Grimoire of Pope Honorius to try and engage with as far as evocation. I, I don't find that they they were very effective. I find if you have something like a Key of Solomon or the Magical Treaties that have more of a full process uh, somewhere within their pages, that's that's probably the best way to to start. Yeah, I would I would definitely agree. I I am right there with you, and I think one of the beautiful things about this quote unquote grimoire renaissance we find ourselves in is there's constant updates. And so with the grimoire and Verum, Joseph H. Peterson is doing amazing work yeah. on that and just released a second edition uh, of his research. The secrets of Solomon that he did is really like awesome. kind of filling in a lot of the gaps yeah. of the grimoire. Of Verum yeah. That we're like, wait, what about this? Another thing that you brought up Douglas about the heptameron that I absolutely love. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. I remember at the beginning of this conversation, I, I think I might've said something like the heptameron is a, you know, very watered down version of the elucidation of necromancy. But I, I, I would say a lot of it, like, you know, 80% of it is, is very similar, mm -hmm. but there are some huge differences. Mm -hmm. But one of the big things that I think p listeners might like, if you're like, how the heck, you know, okay, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to work with the, you know, Douglas is recommending the, um, Hygromantia. This is excellent. And then they start working that. Another thing with the heptameron that I think is really interesting is, the conjurations of the day in the mm. heptameron, right? There are, there are specific conjurations that can be used in and out of ritual yeah. for the planetary angels and the planetary ministers of the day. So I, I think experimenting with those, setting up uh, maybe an altar or some kind of daily practice with those, just those, that's about a paragraph each um, of the seven days of the week, you know, and these seven conjurations, I think that could be an interesting way to get into those planetary, especially with timing, as you say, Douglas, I mean, the Hygromantia has wonderful timing. It's we'll overly it involved. It's overly involved specifically, but I, uh, that's kind of what I like about it. it it's, it's very yeah. specific with its timings. Very, very specific. And we see it carry over in a little bit of a lesser degree in the Heptameron where we have different days and hours, but right. the Hygromantia has different, you know, angels, but also, you know, demonic entities yeah. uh, per hour. And that even goes back to things like the book of wisdom of Apollonius of Tyana that has, I mean, for example, if you want to talk this, I, we, we will not go down this rabbit hole. We'll have to do a, a, a different thing here. I promise this will be 10 seconds. But if you look at the awesome work that um, like Adley Nichols or uh, Andy Foster is doing on the Summa Sacra Magice, right? Mm -hmm. The SSM. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about specificity yeah. that is beyond anything I've ever seen ever. It is a surgeon's scalpel in its precision. It's like the name of the, sure, the angel of the day and the hour. How about the the name of the direction right. of the southeast in autumn right. under, and, and the name of the zodiacal sign of Leo in this season from this direction? Like the yeah. amount of precision is in, it, it's amazing. So I, I think you're right. I think that's been one of the things that's been lost as we get further and further into the the French grimoires in right. the 1800s and 1900s. The yeah. timing is definitely one of those things we need to recover. Yeah, definitely. Alex suggested reading for for Solomonic magic. What do you think people should pick up if this is? Let you know. Like we can we talk about as many grimoires, but what do you think that there's even before they even buy a grimoire, are there things that they should have before doing this kind of magic? Oh gosh, that's that that's a great, really great question. I would say yeah, I would say yes because before, because you, you can easily get a grimoire. But for me, I'll, just from my own experience, when I first picked up the grimoires, you know, like the Lamegatons of Goetia, I was so confused. Yeah. I was, was just like, what is this? You know, <laughs> and just looking at it. And so yes, so for me, I would say a really good introduction to the grimoires would be Secrets of the Magical Grimoires by Aaron Leach. I. I really do recommend this book because it breaks open the, the context of the grimoires 
It looks at the role of the magician and it, and, and it looks how this is even found in the Bible. Like when you look at the relationship between like Moses and Aaron and like the kind of formal priest versus the kind of shamanic um, diviner, if you will, or communicator with the dead and spirits. I think Secrets of the Magical Grimoires is great. Uh, I think the uh, Geo Sophia by Jake Stratton Kent is great because it's it's it explores those Greek origins yeah. on the Goetia. I would say something that you and I have both mentioned. Uh, I, I really think the techniques of Solomonic magic, of course, you know, I, yeah. I know that's something that you've you've touched on really well uh, as well that we both love. I would say too, uh, when you look at Gateways Through Stone and Circle by Frater Ash and Chassan. I, I really do think that's an interesting, fascinating exploration because you see that beautiful tradition of uh, following the grimoire, but also making additions. Like he has an altar of the stars that he places the crystal on and just beautiful things there. And the last one I would recommend is uh, one I just I really enjoy too is An Excellent Book of the Art of Magic by Dr. <laughs> Alexander Cummins. Yeah. It, it's a great grimoire of... Two magicians contemporary with John D. I would not recommend doing the <laughs> conjurations in those because they're very hectoring and threaten dumping spirits and urine and yeah. everything else. But I think if you want something contemporary with John D, mm -hmm. I think it's a fascinating look at kind of more, you know, uh, Solomonic ish language in there. So I, I would say those would be some of the big ones. But how about you? What, what would you recommend? I have this thing that I love passing to people. It's uh, one of the people that worked with Stephen Skinner for the um, his edition of books. Why why can't I think of the name right now? The Source Works of Ceremonial Magic. Um, Don Carr has this online and he keeps updating it. I think it was updated last year, but it is literally called The Study of Solomonic Magic in English. Uh, read through the whole thing. You might not totally understand it, but he actually goes through Aaron Leach's work with the, the Secrets of the Magical Grimoires. He just talks about, you know, what each thing adds to Solomonic magic. Uh, I think that's it. Like, it's an inexhaustible resource. As far as Solomonic magic is concerned, um, he really lays it out there and it's free It'll be in the show notes to this episode. It's in the show notes to the first episode that we did, Alex. Techniques of Solomonic Magic. I think that oh, yeah. this book is so important. I, I, I tell people this is probably the most important book written in the last 20 years for magic. I, I truly believe that. I don't agree with absolutely everything that Stephen says in here, but it is an extremely important work, um, and it's mind-blowing. It's so... It's packed with so much great information. It is, even if you don't want to do this magic practically, it's it's part history of Western magic in there as well. Oh, I could talk about Absolutely. it for I could talk about it for hours. It's just such an important work. I love techniques of Greco-Egyptian magic. I think that if you had to buy one or the other, get Solomonic magic, but techniques of Greco-Egyptian magic tie into uh, Solomonic magic in a way. Uh, Stephen Skinner's work is just exceptional. I'll say that. The Grimoire Encyclopedia by David Rankin just came out. Not every Grimoire listed in there is Solomonic. Just because it says Grimoire doesn't mean it's Solomonic. I want people to understand that. But a lot of the Grimoires in there are Solomonic magic. Volumes 1 and 2, they're so great. Volume 2, so good. It's, it's shock. Again, I wish I had this book 15 years ago. It is amazing. I would also say, again, Grimoire does not mean Solomonic magic. I just said that. But grimoires are very important to Western magic. Owen Davies' book, Grimoires, A History of Magic Books, I think is well worth the read. In between the lines there, you can draw a map in your mind of how Western magic came to be through things like magical grimoires, which are at base what I would say where ritual magic has been informed within a Western context, even heading into what we can call, quote unquote, the new world, which is like North America. Um, these books were very, very important. The magic within them have informed every aspect of magic within the West. The, the Penn State University Press Magic and History series, although not everything in there is Solomonic magic, every single book that is released by this group is exceptional, including a book called The Long Life of Magical Objects. They deal specifically with objects tied into Solomonic magic. I love these books. Those, <laughs> it's, those it's books like, are so it's like if 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 I could take if it's like, okay, Doug, you you need to be able to human beings aren't going to exist for 200 years. I need you to to take a trunk 
and you need to put books in there so that people can understand historic Western magic. I take Surf's Works of Ceremonial Magic and Penn State University Press's Magic and History series and put those in a chunk and lock it away because you will learn more from those two series uh, than you ever will from uh, anybody arguing on the internet or on Facebook right now. Uh, there's a lot of conversation. I will just say there's a lot of conversations that come up uh, regarding Solomonic magic online. Um, not all of them are great. A lot of them can sometimes be really petty. Go to the books for this kind of stuff. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting history. But if I just had one recommendation, techniques of Solomonic magic is just the greatest thing ever. Um, so grab that. Yeah, it, it's it's so great. I'll, I'll just add quickly, um, The Goetia of Dr. Rudd as well yeah. uh, by David Rankin and Dr. Stephen Skinner because the, the first the 20... Yeah. Yeah, I, was just, I think first, we're about to say the, the same thing. The first bit is like... The first 20 pages <laughs> is fantastic, yeah. right? It is a, a perfect... The appendices are great too. I love the appendices of that book also. Oh, the, the appendices are awesome because they fill in a lot of the missing techniques in the Lamegatons of Goetia. Yeah. But yeah, like, I mean, just walking through the history of it, explaining the Solomonic technique, which is also, of course, in Techniques of Solomonic Magic. People right. might be shocked because it's in the title, but I think that you're right. The introduction is, I mean, that alone, especially when I'm talking with people who are like, I know what you're interested in, but I don't know too much about like, what is this magic thing? I'm like, here, just read the first 20 right. pages yes. of the Goetia of Dr. Rudd. And then we can definitely chat. The other one in the, in the uh, Penn state, the PSU, of course, uh, Dr. Richard Kickheffer's forbidden rights. Forbidden rights I think yeah. his introduction on the context of the middle ages and what the conjuration is versus exorcism. And what are these words and what does everything mean? I think, yeah, that, that, as you said, Douglas, that a whole series is, amazing. I mean, Dr. Sophie Page and Catherine Ryder. I mean, there's so many people uh, who are excellent. I, I would definitely say Forbidden Rights is just such a great, and one of the first in like 1997 that I think really pushed the ball forward um, yeah. on research there. Yeah. There's, um, oh God, <laughs> Alex, how have I forgotten? the? Uh, there's a book that deals specifically, Invoking Angels is the name of the book. We haven't done a lot of talking in angels within uh, within this uh, Solomonic magic, uh, these, this two-parter, but angels and Solomonic magic are very linked. There's a, a specific essay in there about um, uh, what's called Seferatziel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Alex is holding up about Seferatziel, which is a very interesting English uh, Solomonic angel grimoire that is... It's really quite in incredible, but everything within there is just so good. Oh yeah, I love this magic. I think it it is it is so brilliant and so so cool. But I have to ask you, Alex, why Solomonic magic? What's to recommend it for others? Because a lot of people will hear us talking, and we've talked for two episodes over five hours of us talking about this specific kind of magic. Seems a bit involved. Like, what? Why would you recommend this magic for other people? Yeah, it's 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 a really good question, and as I, I think as we were talking earlier, Douglas, you know, it really is involved. But anything that you set your mind to is going to be involved. You know, yeah. if you're a tarot card reader, a geomancer, I mean, there's so many things. And so for me, for me, it's 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 really because it's a way of stepping into living esoteric tributaries that have been laid down by previous magicians and previous rituals and setting up a very organized, structured way for the engagement with spirits and, and opening up the pathways for that connection. Because I, I think that's one of the really powerful things and about Solomonic magic and the Solomonic magical tradition, not taking away anything from, in fact, as you said, we didn't get to astrology, but there's a ton of interplay there. Yeah geomancy. There's a ton of inter interplay there. Tarot. I mean, all of these are powerful, powerful methods. But for me, Solomonic magic is involved, but so are so, so is everything else that you will study and dedicate yourself to. And so for me, it's been stepping into the tributaries, but also that I found this radical transformation where when I was going through the tools, as you said, whether it's a paper crown or whether it's, you know, a, a sword forged from some kind of, you know, with, with iron from a graveyard gate, um, whatever it is, when you are making the tools, the gathering the incense, when you're getting up, as you said, Douglas, following the planetary hours, when you're consecrating things at a specific time, there is this initiatory aspect to the Solomonic tradition that I found so grounding and so powerful because it allows you to simultaneously, as we were saying, show uh, fidelity to the tradition, like I'm following this grimoire, but also I'm completely making this grimoire my own, you know? And, and I think, th I think Solomonic 
traditions have this beautiful pathway that you can do both. So I would say those would be the big reasons why I really appreciate, have a deep affinity for them. And I find them this very effective way to um, call to, to invoke, to evoke, and to congregate spirits and to actually have petitions and requests. And most importantly, to build relationships with those spirits for long-term progress too. So I'd say those would be the big things. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll share my personal take here for folks. I get asked quite a bit through uh, email, through direct messages on social media, Doug, why do you engage in a, a form of magic in which there are things like spirits, be they infernal or otherwise? And I say, I had been a practicing magician for upward, about 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 15 years before I found Solomonic Magic proper. And by those 15 years, I had my successes. And for a long time, I was doing what could probably be called lodge-based magic for a great portion of that. And I was finding that that it wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. As wonderful it is, as it is, people know my opinions of certain magical orders and, and certain magical systems. I found Solomonic Magic. It kind of came into my life at a period of time in which uh, my magical efficacy was in a dip. And so I needed magic to be real again. And so I started this, this something about this kind of magic, particularly starting with things like the Greek magical papyri, which although is not Solomonic Magic, it leads into things like Solomonic Magic. And so I started working with certain things from the PGM. And eventually you discovered Solomonic Magic and and uh, things like the Ars Goetia and, and uh, refined things like the Ars Goetia. But Sol- right. Solomonic Magic came into my life at a period of time when I needed magic to be real. And by engaging in this magic from every aspect, from the smallest consecration straight to when you start to bead sweat on your forehead – and your hand is shaking while you are drawing a chalk circle on the floorboards of a boathouse in which there is no other human present for at least a mile. The sweat is stinging your eyes in anticipation. You are scared. The incense is making it hard to breathe. Perhaps the candle might start a fire. Do you actually know what you're doing and what will happen when something shows up? And then something incredible happens and magic becomes real again. There is no other feeling like that. And that is tied through every aspect of Solomonic magic, which at base, I truly believe is the Western magical tradition. It's, this is it. This is where everything else gets informed from this method, these books, these spirits, that are way older than we could ever imagine, if we can even put them in a category whatsoever. Solomonic magic. Solomonic magic yeah. is the way to have a spiritual experience unlike anything else. That thing that a lot of people talk about, that a lot of people think that you can't, it just happens to you. Solomonic magic, you can make it happen. And uh, it is an incredible when you actually devote the time to make it so. So Solomonic magic is just, uh, yeah, I was asked once, you know, like if there's one form of magic you can do for the rest of your life, it's like Solomonic magic because it's everything else. It, it, it's everything oh, else. Yeah. Everything is tied in with this kind of magic. You have to know absolutely everything and it's a constant learning and adapting. So if you want magic to be real, if you need to know magic is real and has real effect and has real spiritual consequences and spooky shit and treasure and all of that stuff that you want from magic. There's no other place than Solomonic magic. So I have to ask you one last question here. How important is Solomonic magic now? Yeah. You know, as we were discussing Douglas, Joseph H. Peterson, just, uh, you know, he was just on the glitch bottle podcast. I asked him about this grimoire Renaissance, um, that we seem to find ourselves in. And he mentioned that, you know, We've just scratched the surface of finding new manuscripts, new connections, cross-pollinations with this rich Solomonic spirit summoning tradition. And I think it's very important now. I mean, I know that Dr. Alexander Cummins, as we discussed, uh, David Rankin, Dr. Stephen Skinner, so many others, they're leading that charge. But in terms of, it's not just historical curiosity, because in terms of importance and efficacy, I think that, as you just touched on, 
it's very important now because Solomonic magic is it's a very effective tool that the technique itself for communing with spirits. And so the dedication, the fidelity to the tradition that you have and the beautiful adventure of, as you say, throwing yourself into the deep end, making your own tools and, you know, calling a spirit for the first time and seeing what resonates with you. All of that is deeply personal and it's very efficacious. And as we've shown with the elucidarium, the elucidation of necromancy manuscripts, I think we are just at the cusp of discovering or you know rediscovering these techniques of solomonic magic in terms of like how can we show fidelity to the grimoire but also how can we have room for our own personal innovations and so you know it's important now because and it's really important now because unlike douglas say something like taoist magic which is much more preserved in many parts of asia say you know from master to apprentice master to apprentice this kind of Western, as you say, this quote unquote Western tradition for many years has been fragmented, but this rich, deep, incredible tradition, it's being reforged anew with new research, scholarship, cross-pollination, showing fidelity to the grimoires, new innovations. And this practice, as, as you say, this, as, as, as you did, um, you know, and as you do call having this practical application of it, in addition to the scholarship, I think that's all coming together that, is passing the baton on this grimoire track, if you will, for many, many years to come. So I don't know. I'm I'm optimistic. I'm excited for what's coming around the bend. And as you said, just to echo your wonderful point, I just think it's it really is the heart of the of the Western esoteric tradition for sure. And I, I'm just going to say this: it is nowhere will you find the heartbeat beating louder than in Glitch Bottle podcast. Glitch Bottle has my favorite episode. There's episodes that I have listened to four or five times. I think that nobody has been better at encapsulating the breakthroughs and bringing on the innovators and their innovations. Just giving room to practitioners of this form of magic. And it's not the only thing you cover on your show, Alex, but it's a large part of of glitch bottle podcast you have done such amazing work and it's it's just i it, it, glitch bottle is in my opinion the greatest magic podcast that has ever existed and i really hope that you continue with the project because oh my um, gosh i i think it's just fantastic that you that not only do you have the knowledge that you bring when you when you have people on your show is that you just give them the space to be able to talk about it and and there's a set there's a there's an effortlessness to their responses that i think that they know they're talking to somebody who isn't a, a clown i'll just say that that they can actually be like oh alex knows what he's talking about alex is asking the right questions um and so i'm going to be able to actually talk to a, a, a true peer here before glitch bottle that space never existed so I, I have to commend you for creating that and i tell Everybody that listens to my show, if you don't listen to Glitch Bottle, then you're truly missing out on the greatest magic podcast that has ever existed. Oh my gosh, Douglas, I didn't know I could blush that much. Uh, Thank you so. That is incredibly kind. That is incredibly generous. I, I, I am so. I am. It's, it's a huge honor. It's a huge responsibility. And I have to say, uh, yes, it's certainly been an exciting journey and different guests and and kind of content and videos that that'll explore deep aspects of the Solomonic tradition. But Douglas, before this podcast, I mean, just I mean, uh, I was just sharing with you the way that you have these amazing guests and the facets of esotericism that you explore and the way that you, we were talking about for the podcast, the way you lucidly break topics down that are so complicated. It's like drinking from a fire hose and you're able to take that complexity and distill it down individually with individual topics, but also, you know, with guests, we were just chatting about your uh, excellent episode with Julio Cesar Ode mm -hmm. for the podcast. Yeah. And so whether it's that, or, I mean, there's so many dozens and dozens and dozens, but you have this wonderful affinity as well. And so, I mean, I, I, I really hope that, you know, everyone listening right now to what magic is this, it is so valuable and it is so important and it's so wonderful that you're listening because as you say, it's so complicated. And so having an amazing channel, an amazing program that you have, I think is just, it is 
a boon. <laughs> it is wonderful. So thank you. I'm going to put it this way, Alex. I'm the kids' table. I'm not trying to make my listeners and the people that love my show like like I'm not trying to infantilize, infantilize them. Like my show is is mainly introductory. It's great. If people listening to my podcast and really love my podcast want to sit at the adults' table, you have to go to Glitch Ball. Like there's there's stuff that you cover on your podcast that like I won't touch because I know it's just far too complicated for me to do. For people, if they need to kick it up a notch, if they need to do that, you have to listen to Glitch Bottle. Every episode is a cause for celebration. And uh, Alex, we're so lucky to have you. We're so lucky to to have people respect you as much as they do and want to appear on your show. You've had guests that I'm just like, whoa, <laughs> I can't believe Alex has talked to this person. It's so it's so neither crazy can I, that, Douglas. Neither can I. I right, can't right. It's so it's so weird that this happens, Alex. Tell us what's going on for Glitch Bottle and for the next little while here. Tell us, tell us about the Patreon and what you do there. Tell us, tell the people where they can find your work because I know that they're going to love this episode as much as they loved the the previous one. And uh, I just want everybody to to go to to Glitch Bottle and be a part of the Glitch Ball Bottle uh, experience because it is it has been so helpful for me and it's so yeah. Please give give people everything. Well, first of all, let me say it is an honor to also be a patron and a supporter of yours on patreon.com slash what magic is this because hey, nice. your, your, uh, your supporters and, and having that is just so important. And, and exactly, I, I know Douglas, you and I are, um, you know, we, we have, you know, having podcasts, there are costs to running this. Um, and so whether it's servers, whether it's, you know, uh, RSS feeds, whether it's editing software, like no matter what it is. Yes. I, I am so fortunate uh, for yourself and I'm so fortunate for, um, the patrons over on patreon.com slash glitch bottle. That's where if you are willing to subject yourself to an inordinate amount of nerdiness and just strange things and, and exploring topics and being able to ask guests questions and everything, please come on by. Yeah. I, I would say Patreon is, dot com slash glitch bottle is just a great way um, to support the channel if you if you enjoy it and just as I you know love your channel so much and and support it and um, and yeah we have some very uh, some very uh, big guests coming up as well who are returning on the podcast uh, which is great so you can ask questions uh, I'm working on another uh, video exploring the relationship between um, Catholic exorcistic formulae and the grimoires formulae nice. and so there's some interesting interplay there and so we'll we'll hear from uh, a few people on that so yeah just like interesting topics and you know planetary magic and and just working and looking at the solomonic technique and so with with all of those things you know just really delving deep into the tradition it's it's something that i know just as you douglas and just as what you do it's it's just something that you you cannot not do, you know, like you just yeah. have this, this drive and desire to do it. So I, I certainly share that with you. And yeah, I would say patreon.com slash glitch bottle. You can also find me on, oh, all the things, you know, Twitter, Instagram, just type in glitch bottle and you will, if, if you see a very strange, you know, bottle logo, that's probably me if you type that in. So <laughs> so can I just say the one thing I wish you did a little bit more of, yeah, Man, your your deep dives, I I adore your deep dives. I think I I love solo Alex. I really really do. Like I want, I love that you do it. You do it for uh, for Patreon um, uh, a little bit more so than you do it for like the, your YouTube channel and things like that. But man, uh, I can listen to you talk all day. I think that that's one of those things. I know. But here's the thing: coming from somebody who does those things, they take a long time. Like there, it's not. It's relying on your own lonesome. It's it's time consuming. So I understand why there's <sighs> they're they're not as 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 plentiful as the as the interviewing other folks. But I love them, Alex. You know, your deep dives are so great as well. And I, I know exactly what you mean. I mean, I'm the Catholic exorcism one that I'm working on. That's a deep dive and that's taking yeah. a very long time to get the scripting for that. Uh, but you're right. Yeah. The, I, I, I appreciate that Douglas. Thank you. And yeah, it was, and it's fun. It's fun when we did a, a deep dive on the conjurations of the day from the heptameron. It's fun. We do a deep dive on, on the nomina magica and actually looking at the actual spelling of these words, what these words actually mean and, and just these deep dives. So thank you for that. And I, I really love doing those deep dives as well. And, and more are, are certainly coming too. So 
if the if the gods are willing. Right, <laughs> folks. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. And you're like, ah, Doug and Alex, all they did was like compliment each other the entire show. Deal with it. Um, and But please, 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 truly, um, as talking as a podcaster, we need your support. Alex, I need Alex to keep doing his work because he's doing very important stuff here. And there's things that he brings up and guests that he has that are are just adding to the fuel of, of this this wonderful fire that we have that's called contemporary ritual magic. And so please, I'm begging you, if you are, if you are a supporter of my podcast, please support glitch bottle as well. If you think that I'm a goof, but you think that Alex is really awesome, go support Alex because I would rather see Alex's podcast on the waves than my own. Truly. No. Like I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say that. I think that glitch bottle is, is, uh, is very, very important. And, and uh, please support Alex. Please, please, please. Seriously, I'm not joking. Support Alex's work. A glitch bottle. Go to the Patreon. Please. I have links as to where to find all of Alex's things and all of the glitch bottle things available on my website for this specific episode of... An Introduction to Solomonic Magic with Alexander F. Continued up at whatmagicisthis.com. There you can also find some amazing show notes. Not going to be as many show notes for this one as the last episode that we did, the introductory episode that we did a year ago back in October of 2022. So please go to that page as well. There'll be a link, obviously, on my website to go to the, those links. So a lot of the things we talked about in this episode also are in the show notes on that page, but there'll be some new ones as well, some interesting links. Please check those out. Also on whatmagicisthis.com, you can find a link to my Twitter account, my Facebook account, as well as my Instagram account. I am not as active on Instagram and Facebook as I am on Twitter, but actually these days it's kind of, <laughs> I'm not spending very much time on very much social media anywhere because uh, I'm busy. I got things to do. There's podcasts to make, there's books to read. There are flowers to smell. Well, Maybe not where I am. It's it's turning into winter here, which is awesome because I get to snowboard. Anyhow, what I'm trying to say is that uh, less time on social media, the better. But if you reach out to me there, I'll try to answer your questions and things of that nature. But uh, give me a follow. I sometimes put up some pretty cool or interesting things in all of those places. Do you think I'm doing something important? Uh, almost as important as Alex? Because seriously, Alex is doing such important stuff. Please, please, please support Alex. But if you'd also like to support me and what I do, there's three ways of doing that. Um, let's go through them. Every single time I release an episode, I cover it. Uh, this one's no different. So uh, hang in there and, uh, and please listen up because you who knows? I might say something funny. I try to say at least one funny thing in all of my outro monologues for the each episode. But anyways, who knows? Maybe I might not say anything funny for this one. You never know. But uh, three ways of supporting my show. First way is the best way. That's Patreon as well. Patreon.com slash what magic is this? Seven bucks a month. That's all I'm asking. Seven dollars American. That's nothing. I mean, I, that's what? That's a, a few rolls of toilet paper these days? You know? There, there's nothing, right? That's... So little money. That's that's a drink at a bar, right? That's that's not even an ounce of brandy these days. But you get access to so many exclusive features. They're all wonderful. They're all amazing. I do exclusive episodes about entities like saints or gods or spirits. I have episodes about books. I do episodes about podcast topics that I've already talked about. I just talk about them a little bit more. I've got episodes on like Solomonic magic and Goetia and grimoires. There's so much stuff on my Patreon. It is always amazing. It's incredible. It's like a whole different podcast. If you like what I do here on What Magic Is This, you're going to love what I do on the Patreon. There's videos there as well. It gives you access to an amazing Discord server, which has just grown by leaps and bounds, and everybody's doing awesome there. It's so good. 
Oh, also a big uh, reason to join my Patreon is that you get to uh, take part in voting on what will be covered on these main podcasts. I literally just put up a poll the other day, and uh, people are voting. There's some amazing topics, so you get to see what's coming down the What Magic Is This pipeline. That poll is going to be running all the way until uh, Christmas Day. So if you sign up at any point before the uh, 25th of December of 2023, you will have an opportunity to vote on perhaps what will get covered on the podcast. Add your name to the list to to certain topics. There's some really good ones this voting period. So that's another reason to join the Patreon. $7 is Patreon. Like So head to patreon.com slash what magic is this. Get seven bucks up, put it on the counter. I'll take it and I'll make some great, great content or offerings for everybody there. It is well worth its weight in gold. And by gold, I mean American dollars um, because that's the standard in the world right now. I think it's like 10 bucks Canadian. I think all of my best work is on the Patreon. Truly. I truly do. And and in fact, on this episode, uh, I'm going to share a bit of an episode I put up recently about a uh, 17th century person who confessed to witchcraft by the name of Isabel Gowdy. So here's a little segment from that episode, and it is truly one of the best things I've ever done, I think. Uh, So uh, I hope uh, this little snippet here from that episode, which is about an hour long. I hope that this snippet here uh, whets the appetite and perhaps might convince you to um, be evoked to my Patreon. So, So have a listen here. We will be situating ourselves in Scotland, particularly in and around the 16th and 17th century. You see, around this time, there was an unprecedented increase in the number of men and women who were prosecuted for witchcraft. The clergy in and around Scotland at the time found it fairly easy to whip up within the minds of the people of Scotland that the devil was working through many people. There have been many statistics, and the number fluctuates as we move forward in time, but at least 4,000 people were accused of witchcraft between 1563 and 1737 in Scotland alone. Scotland itself was rife with a group of people that have been nicknamed the Prickers, who would go from town to town to search for people suspected of being witches, as they would have marks on their body, the mark of the witch. This mark itself would not feel pain and it would not bleed if it was pricked with a sharp instrument like a needle or a pin or a bodkin. These witch finders would earn a living by pricking people suspected or accused of being witches. And one of them was a woman of childbearing age by the name of Isabel Gowdy. You see, what Isabel did in and around 1662 in a village called Aldern was confess to witchcraft through a series of four interrogations and confessions. We know almost nothing of the life of Isabel Gaudi. She most likely lived with her husband around Loch Loy, which is two miles north of Aldern. He was most likely a farm laborer, and they would have most likely lived in a turf house. Her husband would have been a laborer on this farm, growing flax and uh, milking, so it was because of this labor that they probably had their house. He would have been called a cotter, which is basically a farmer. Isabel most likely would spend her entire day doing chores. Things like uh, making bread, baking, weaving yarn, and weeding caring to whatever animals that they were um, custodians of. We do not know the reasons as to why Isabel was brought forward. There is speculation, most of it revolving around one individual who was present at all four interrogations of Isabel. The confessions took place over a six-week period, and it was probably during this six weeks that Isabel was kept in solitary confinement at a toll booth or a townhouse in Aldern. She was most likely tormented by the guards there and certainly uh, was unable to see her husband or, or anybody else. She would have been truly alone. 
but it is because of four confessions made over these six weeks in 1662 that we know of Isabel Gaudi. So what did she say? What was the content of her confessions? Well, to keep it simple, basically everything you know about witchcraft. That's a nice little taste there and wet your beak with a bit of my Patreon stuff. Truly, I think that this recent episode I did about Isabel Gowdy, which I released uh, before Halloween of 2023, is some of the best stuff I've ever done. I say this not as an enticement, but I say this as being as honest as I can. I think that my best work, my most creative work, my most interesting work that I do is all on my Patreon. So please, if you can see your way to supporting myself, as well as Alex from Glitch Bottle, who's been so kind to me throughout the years. Seriously, Alex is the absolute best. But my stuff, if you want to support it and you want to see more of it, you want this uh, podcast to continue because this is my job, I would love to see you on the Patreon. That is patreon.com slash whatmagicisthis or head to whatmagicisthis.com and click any number of the links. If you don't like the whole Patreon thing but you still want to support me some way financially, go ahead to whatmagicisthis.com, find any number of the PayPal me links. I will take PayPal. You can give me any little chunk of change that you have. Five bucks, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, any increment. Hopefully it's in the dollars and not the cents category, but uh, I'll take some cents, whatever. Who, 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 who amongst us could use a little bit of change. Am I right? But uh, that goes straight back. Any amount that you donate through the PayPal, it just goes right back into making sure that this podcast runs because uh, things are expensive, man. And uh, I need the best internet and I need the best things. And so the only way to do that for me is uh, is to pay some money for the best stuff. And uh, if you donate through PayPal, that goes right back into making sure that the fires stay lit here at the What Magic Is This headquarters. And, of course, the final way of supporting the show is showing your support by grabbing some of my merchandise. Head to whatmagicisthis.com, go to the menu there, click on the little merch, and that'll take you to my tea Public store that has T-shirts, hoodies, it's got children's clothing, it's got tote bags, stickers, magnets, so much stuff. I've got tapestries. I don't think, actually, I don't think I have tapestries. Sorry, everybody. No tapestries. I forgot about the tapestries things. And unfortunately, the the notebooks are no longer available, which is a real shame because the notebooks were the absolute best. Anyhow, I've got about uh, nine or 10 or 12. I forget how many designs I have up there, but uh, they're made by myself and a couple of people who have been very kind in designing logos for me. You can get those on mugs. They can get them anywhere. I just put one out for Halloween that looks kick-ass. It looks awesome. So please show your support by grabbing some swag, some what magic is this swag that would be really appreciated. I don't see a lot of money from, uh, from the merchandise, like literally less than, <laughs> less than, I don't know, a 12 pack of donuts from Tim Hortons or Dunkin' Donuts. What do you guys have down in Krispy Kreme? I don't know what you guys have down there. Robins? Do you guys have Robin Donuts down in Robins Donuts? I don't even think those are around in Canada anymore, actually. Anyhow, whatever. I don't make very much money from the merchandise. Not complaining. Love seeing people in my gear. It is so awesome and surreal to me that I have t-shirts and people wear them and they wear them proudly. And I would love to see you wear some. Send me some photos, grab some merchandise and please, please wear it everywhere. When somebody stops, he's like, what magic is this? You'll say, listen to it, sucker. It's a podcast. It's the greatest podcast ever. Where two guys who have podcasts just compliment each other for the entire podcast, but it's still the information that they're sharing is the absolute greatest. I love it. And they did a two-parter on Solomonic Magic. I learned more in that five hours of podcast content that they gave me than I would ever learn listening to any other podcast that exists. This is true. We just did it. In fact, we're coming to the end of this conversation right now. Um, Sorry, it's the end of the episode, but uh, I got to do it. So anyways... I would love to see your support somehow. And Alex would love to see your support somehow. We can only do these things if we have your support. 
So the best way of supporting me is, again, through Patreon. Patreon.com slash whatmagicisthis. Uh, but otherwise, head to whatmagicisthis.com for all of the things. Alex, thank you once again for coming on and, and talking Solomonic Magic. I know people are going to love this show. And I can't, I can't wait for everybody to listen. And thanks so much for joining me and just doing what you do. You, you are such an exceptional uh, podcaster. I love everything you do, but just all of your efforts are so appreciated in every place that you, uh, you, you put your work. Uh, Douglas, the honor, truly the honor and the pleasure is mine. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. And I have to say, thank you for your work really, because it is opening so many doors, countless doors in this mansion of esotericism and, and the Western esoteric tradition. So Thank you so much. It is truly always a pleasure. Thank you. I, I, I have to ask though, man, like if we, we did two episodes together on this kind of stuff. I can't even think like, what would, what would there be a third? Who knows? But I would hope that at some point in the future, I'd ask you to come back on the show. I hope that you'd be like, you know what? Yeah, I, I could, I could use some more compliments. Let's, let's go on. Uh, let's go on Doug's show again. Cause uh, he seems to heap them on me and, and, and vice versa. So, but I, I would really hope that if I, uh, if you wanted to come back on the show, you'd be, uh, you'd be good to do so. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Well, we even said astrology. Oh, I think, um, talking about the sworn book of Honorius, we can talk about, I mean, there's so yeah. many different, absolutely. It would be an honor. It would be an honor. Really. Amazing. All right, everybody. That's the show. Support Alex. Go if, t- listen to it all. Listen to every episode, really subscribe to the YouTube, go on the Patreon everywhere. Alex, do you have students just to complete, do you have a webpage still for, for glitch bottle you do, or, or did that go? Oh, I do. I do. Yes. Glitchbottle.com. Okay. Yes. That should take you right there. Thank you. Thank you. Doug. I'm absolutely horrible at remembering all of them, but you, you as usual have a much better memory. than Oh I man. No. <laughs> <laughs> Please glitchbottle.com, patreon.com slash glitch bottle support job drum any one of the tiers there, but preferably the more expensive ones. Uh, just uh, give give Alex all the money in the world because because uh, he deserves it. All right, everybody, that's the that's the end of the uh, the dip into Solomonic magic. We've been talking about it for five hours here. I hope we've given you some places to jump off from here. Uh, but go to the show notes for this episode. Everything that Alex and I talked about today will be in the show notes. I'll also have a link to the uh, previous episode show notes for this one because I, I have a lot of links there as well. Buy the books, uh, Skinner's, uh, Peterson's, Rankin's, Leitch's. These are all great books. So uh, that's the show, everybody. All right. Holy smokes, we're we're, reaching, we're over two and a half hours here, but uh, I know you loved it. I certainly had a blast. And uh, come on back to What Magic Is This? We'll talk about more of this chalk on the floor, the wand waving, the, the sword sharpening, the uh, memorizing thing we like to call magic in the occult. Until next time, everybody, stay healthy, stay hopeful, and stay luminous. We will talk at you soon. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.